Everybody. This is the October 21st, 22 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Hardesty. Here. Wheeler. Here. Now we're going to hear from our amazing legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before Council, in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the Council agenda on the Council Clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for the communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself since once council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene, reconvene virtually. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications. Our first individual, please, Keelan, and that is number 874. Request of Chris Reed to address council regarding Southwest Capitol Highway Rose Lane project effect on Hillsdale. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. My name is Chris Braidwood Reed. I manage commercial property in Hillsdale. I come today to follow up on the Capitol Highway Rose Lane project, which has been stalled five weeks ago. As we feared, the project has left the community confused and frustrated. Aftermath issues we initially expressed have already come true. Eastbound, one business on the south side reports a 9% loss of revenue from the prior month due to loss of evening community, community 
commuting customers. Several businesses are reporting an increase in their morning commute, oftentimes waiting through three cycles of a traffic signal to get into Hillsdale, causing employees to be late. Buses are also caught in this backlog getting to Hillsdale Bat Lane, enough to cause riders requesting to get off the bus prior to the stop just so that they are not late to work. Any time saved utilizing, utilizing the Bat Lane is lost in the time getting into Hillsdale. This, is, this will only increase when traffic counts increase. Any carbon emissions saved by a bus using the Bat Lane is also lost in the backlog of traffic getting into Hillsdale. There's increased difficulty turning into the Southside parking lot, having to cross a bus lane while trying to avoid bikers and pedestrians. Drivers feel this is a dangerous experience. Southside parking lot is a disaster at times due to the difficulty exiting the lot, crossing over or merge into the consolidated eastbound lane of cars that has limited access points. And reports of customers detouring around and entirely Hillsdale entirely because the lanes are so confusing. All of these issues are caused by a plan intended to save one to two minutes during morning peak times based on pre-COVID traffic counts. Traffic counts that we do not currently have nor can we predict when or if we will. Westbound evening peak hour complaints continue to increase on the backup from Barber to Capitol Highway. Capitol Highway and Sunset intersection is extremely confusing for those cars wanting to turn right onto Sunset due to the red paint. A bus in the lane makes it even more confusing. Cars that want to turn right onto Sunset have begun detouring onto Capitol Highway and DeWitt to bypass the intersection. Why have a lane that is used perhaps one to 2% of the day empty the rest causing these issues? In August, I invited city commissioners to take a field trip to Hillsdale before the project is installed. Today, I invite Commissioner Hardesty to take the same trip, entering and exiting the south parking lot. I'm happy to meet and be a guide if that would be helpful. We will be emailing this week for a time certain for your visit and for a PBOT assessment of the impact of this project. TriMet is currently proposing to discontinue 12 bus lines in southwest Portland by October 31st. Those proposals combined with PBOT's insistence to install a Rose Lane project in Hillsdale where more harm is caused than good makes no sense. Currently traffic counts are still low and with the initial negative feedback we are receiving due to the project, I shudder to think of how much it will escalate with increased traffic counts. With the continuation of COVID and the practice of hybrid environments, the likelihood of having pre-COVID traffic counts is uncertain. Please stop the negative impact on the business and the neighborhoods and remove Capitol Highway Project. We appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I'm forgetting my job. My, the, the next individual, please, uh, 875 just considering what she was saying. And thank you, by the way, for the, the, uh, the documents. It's helpful. Thank you. Request of Sarah Pearson to address council regarding Southeast Division Street median causing road rage. Um, I don't believe Sarah has joined us yet. Is she online? She is not. Very good. Next individual, please. And item, item number 876. Request of Tanya Pearson to address council regarding Southeast Division Street safety. Good morning. They, I don't think they've joined us yet All either. All right, very good. 876, please. Uh, 877. Seven. Uh, you're right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I need Thanks. to learn how to count. 877 is the next individual, please. Request of Jane Lacey to address council regarding experience working in Portland Parks and Recreation as an arborist. Good morning. Good morning. Honorable Mayor, Commissioner Maps, Rubio, Hardesty and Ryan. My name is Jane Lacey. I've been an arborist with the city of Portland for 19 years. I'm represented by Layuna, uh, Portland City Laborers uh, Union 483, which represents frontline employees that are the backbone of the city. My colleagues and I regularly deal with trash, biohazards such as fecal matter and uncapped hypodermic needles violence including gun violence on a daily basis conducting our work throughout the city. We regularly engage with people under mental health crisis and under rampant substance abuse from drugs such as fentanyl, methamphetamine. Our compassion fatigue has reached a tipping point Personal possessions are being stolen from our work vehicles while we're on the job. Our shops are being vandalized and broken into. 
We've come to work in the field every day since the pandemic started almost three years ago. After the onset of the pandemic, we've also been here during wildfire smoke, during heat, and inclement weather. We work until you close the city, sir. Once, our jobs were sought after and revered. I've been employed since October 23rd, 2003. When I was hired here, my dad acted like I was getting married. Now, <laughs> these jobs aren't so widely sought after. They're not competitive. The role of a city worker has changed dramatically over the past several years. We are social workers, camp counselors, and a janitorial service. Consider all that we do for the community to keep this city running. We are the backbone that makes Portland a glorious place for our citizens to call home. Costs have skyrocketed with food, housing, gas. I live 24.6 miles one way from Tabor Yard where I work. Currently there's a construction project and we are not allowed to park on site any further. This is the first time that I've ever had to park outside of my work unit. Division is one of the scariest streets in Portland. PCL is currently under contract negotiations. We need a wage increase that reflects our professionalism, our sacrifices, and the cost of inflation. We require a fair contract that makes sure we're safe in the workplace and can afford to live here in the community we serve. Thank you kindly for allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being here. And you speak for many. I, I've had similar conversations with many of our public employees. I particularly want to acknowledge that you and your colleagues worked throughout the pandemic. And that's part of obviously the, the broader conversation we're having about the future of work, the future of our workforce. And uh, the first step is to really acknowledge and honor those employees who did come in through the entirety of the pandemic. And I want to thank you and your colleagues for that. Second of all, the shift in responsibility uh, as a result, to be perfectly blunt, of the burgeoning homeless crisis that we have in our city, I acknowledge that that has been a significant factor in uh, the employment of all of our folks out in the field. Uh, I won't speak for Commissioner Maps, but I know many of his employees have, have spoken to me about some of the concerns they have for their public safety. Um, so I, I want you to know we don't have all the answers, but we absolutely acknowledge and agree with you that there is a problem here. And we do want to respect the work you do. It's hard work, and I want to thank you for it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. If there's anything I could do to further assist, let me know. Absolutely. Mr. Mayor, can I jump in yeah, here? Yeah, please, Commissioner Maps. Uh, hey, hey, Jane, I just wanted to th uh, thank you for coming in and raising uh, your concerns, especially your safety concerns. As the mayor mentioned, uh, you know, I'm the commissioner in charge of water and BES, so I have people out in the field, and we have the same experiences that uh, you do. I have um, employees um, threatened and assaulted all the time. I will tell you I have... Um, you know, infrastructure employees who work in the field who have requested bulletproof vests from me um, because they feel like they need it in order to um, do the work that um, we ask them to do. I take these safety concerns very seriously. Um, I'm working with my own bureaus, and I certainly uh, will be working with my colleagues on council to make sure that um, you guys stay safe on the job. And um, we also, I also want to express my appreciation for the work that you do. Uh, so thank you, and um, let's stay at the table and work together to um, keep each other safe and keep the city safe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you so much for coming here today. You speak for so many city employees who uh, don't have the courage to come and stand in front of these five intimidating or four intimidating people. There's five. <laughs> Um, let me just say, as someone who has over 500 maintenance workers who show up every day, do the work that they're asked to do, don't complain, and from March of 2020 on, every single day of the week, they are having the exact same experience that you're having in public. Because the reality is we have just way too much untreated mental health issues on our street. 
We have way too much untreated alcohol and drug addiction. And we don't have a plan on how to solve one and two before we get to number three, housing people can afford to live in. So I am really grateful that you're here. And uh, I am not unaware and daily uh, am talking to uh, folks in my portfolio about how to keep them safe. And my response always is, if, if your spider's tingly senses tell you it's unsafe, it's unsafe. And as your boss, I have your back. So it, you need to make sure to not ever uh, ignore your spider senses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. I just want to really thank you for coming forward. And, and just uh, we've met with uh, some of your colleagues as well. And also in BES, we had the chance to tour some of the areas that were impacted. And I, just hearing what you're having to engage in on a daily basis is really, I, I can't imagine. So again, I, my colleagues have said it all, but I just want to, again, thank you for the courage of showing up today and for saying what's true. And um, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and, but you need to know we're super committed to addressing these very same things because we, we could not be doing the work but for, for you and, and colleagues like you. Um, and just uh, we will definitely be um, visiting this in ra uh, labor relations as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah. Jane, thanks for being here. It was in uh, September of 2020 that I was sworn into office. One of my first meetings was with the Bureau of Directors of Parks and Water and BES. And I asked them, what's really going on on the ground? And they all spoke um, to what you were saying just now. So, and it's really refreshing to hear directly from somebody that's on the ground doing the work. So we're well aware. I think you'll see some of the resolutions this afternoon speak to some of your concerns as well. And uh, I really appreciate you for having the courage to come and speak to all of us. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. I want to do more than just survive. I want to thrive. Please remember us when you vote. Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> Keelan, have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. We actually have one more. Oh, did I skip some? I'm sorry. Yes, the last individual, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, 878, request of Lily Gilbert to address council regarding experience working as a Portland Parks and Recreation horticulturist. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Lily Gilbert. <clears throat> I'm a union member of Laborers 483, and I work as a horticulturist for Portland Parks in the East Maintenance Zone. I've been in my position for eight months, and prior to that, I was a park technician for three years with the same work group. <clears throat> in light of the fact that our contract is currently under negotiation with the city, I felt compelled to come here today to raise awareness about the importance of the work that park maintenance workers do. I believe that when Portlanders, Portlanders voted for the parks levy, that was a clear indication of the importance that the people place on this city's parks as a public resource and a, a desire to see the parks improved and well cared for. Well, that is what we do. We care for the parks. We make them safe and clean and accessible, sometimes at our own peril. We keep the city's outdoor living space maintained for all to use. This includes the restrooms, picnic areas, parking lots, landscapes, playgrounds, sports fields, rose gardens, skate parks, and recreation facilities. We address hazards in parks, like after storms. <clears throat> we mark and remove hazards and clean up debris. When parks are used as public dumping grounds, we haul junk and garbage away. We clean up human waste and needles and broken glass from playgrounds, landscapes, restrooms, and parking lots. Myself and many of my coworkers have experienced needle pricks and had to deal with the fear and uncertainty of potential exposure to bloodborne pathogens. When I talk with other maintenance workers, overwhelmingly, people are concerned with their safety and note that the job conditions have significantly changed from what they once were. When we go out to work in the field, we are usually alone, <clears throat> often confronted with an erratic, unstable public. Workers have been assaulted, accosted, screamed at, and verbally abused. I work in a state of hypervigilance, especially at sites where I feel isolated and vulnerable. This can be exhausting. All of this is just to say that we work hard and the work is hard. 
When the city shut down for the pandemic, when people holed up in the safety of their homes, we showed up to work, facing the uncertainty of the pandemic head on, and we were scared. At times it felt like we were left to fend for ourselves while most were safely at home, but we had to keep the restrooms open and keep the parks clean, especially for our residents who are living outside. We have watched as our wages are losing ground while the costs of fuel, groceries, utilities, and goods rise. You all know the pain of filling up at the gas station. <clears throat> well, our members don't have the ability to defer commuting expenses by working from home. In closing my statement, I want to say, if you value the work that we do, please show it by supporting a fair contract for our members. And thank you for, our t for your time. And Commissioner Rubio, thank you for coming to our employee appreciation lunch. It was great to see you there. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. How did you have oh, you? I'm sorry. Did you? Just, no? no? But thank you so much for your yeah. comments. And I, anytime you invite me, I will be there. So I would love to, to join again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Keelan, that completes communications Best. this morning. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty has let me know that she is pulling item 892 back to her office. Are there other items that have been pulled from the consent agenda? Yes, we've had four other items pulled. Uh, 883. Hang on. 883. 886. 886. 890. 890. And 891. 891. And for the few items left on the consent agenda, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Trivial? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The minimal consent agenda has been approved. No, we've only done one. That is true, we have it. It's not a record yet. Um, first time certain item, please. Item number 879, which is a report. Accept Oregon, the state of sport report. Colleagues, this item is a report to accept a new economic study, Oregon, the state of sport. This analysis highlights Oregon's competitive advantages and the economic contributions that the athletic, outdoor, team, and recreational ecosystem make to our state. The athletic and outdoor industry here is a critical part of our state as well as our local economy, and it's a driver of good paying jobs and positive community impact. It's a key industry cluster and a focus of our economic development efforts and city, state, regional strategies around economic prosperity. Prosper Portland and other organizations like the Portland Business Alliance have been engaged in support for this industry for a number of years and have created a valuable network of resources to attract and retain talent and employees. This morning, we're going to hear short presentations from Prosper Portland on their work to support this important industry cluster and from the Portland Business Alliance, who worked as part of a coalition to produce this study. First, I'd like to introduce Shay Flaherty Betton, Director of Economic Development at Prosper Portland, to describe Prosper's work in support of this industry. Shay, good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Shay Flaherty Betton, and I'm the Economic Development Director at Prosper Portland. And I'm thrilled to be here alongside our PBA colleagues to share more about our region's athletic and outdoor economy, as well as our broader sports economy. But first, briefly, I want to remind you how our city currently invests in this space today. Within our economic development department, the business advancement team helps growing businesses by identifying opportunities and providing support so they create living wage jobs and equitable economic growth in turn. The business advancement team has a suite of programs and referrals for three key areas, business competitiveness, inclusive job creation, and equitable economic growth. The team leads partnerships and initiatives within four industry clusters where our city is the most competitive, including the athletic and outdoor industry. Our Portland Means Progress program is also housed here, and that leverages the team's relationships within our business community to further racial equity goals. Our financial incentive programs, such as the Enterprise Zone and our Inspiring Diversity Grant, also require that companies join Portland Means Progress so they can report on their culture change efforts, intentional hiring, or diverse procurement on an annual basis. And I'll just note that within our inclusive economic development strategy, we are reviewing these priority clusters and we look forward to bringing you a draft next month. So Portland is really fortunate to be a national leader in this sector. Even in the face of economic uncertainty ahead, there are fantastic opportunities on the horizon for the industry. There's a lot to be excited about. 
from the fact that sales in 2022 are expected to surpass pre-COVID levels to projections that see the re-commerce market growing to 36 billion in 2024. And I just wanna be really clear, these are not just big numbers and big business. This translates directly into Portland's local cultural fabric and retail trends. We've seen a rise across the city in reselling and sports culture stores in Portland, such as Back to the Basket on Southeast Hawthorne, which is a native-owned, curated retail experience set around the theme of basketball and a love for the game. So speaking to our region's asset, Portland has an immense competitive advantage in this sector. Across every metric, if you think number of firms, ties to research and academia, and from a human capital standpoint. You'll hear more in-depth uh, stats from PBA President Hone shortly, but here you can see just a regional financial impact of this sector at a glance. From a human capital standpoint alone, the fact that we have the highest concentrations of athletic and outdoor professionals in the nation speaks volumes, especially if you consider that companies have been saying yes to Portland through their expansions in recent months, and you think about folks like Fila and Allbirds and how they've been moving to Portland. And if we dive deeper into this data and we look at demographic trends, we'd also see that within Multnomah County, 48% of the employees in this industry are women, which is way above the national average, and 32% of the employees identify as people of color, which is really high for a traded sector in our area. Briefly, I wanna paint a picture of how our business advancement team interfaces with firms. Here you see how a cluster liaison would work with an athletic and outdoor company who wants to grow and be more inclusive as a workplace. We can offer site assistance, either via partners such as the Port of Portland or via our own ability to look for sites in a brokerage database. With site selections, we can look at if they qualify for different incentive programs, such as the Enterprise Zone or programs in specific TIF districts. We also work with Prosper's Lending Team and Business Oregon to identify loan products that could address the company's capital needs, and we take companies to trade shows so they can explore new markets. Uh, finally, to aid companies in being more inclusive, we offer the Inspiring Diversity Grant, which resources initiative within firms around inclusive hiring, culture change, and community partnerships. And then to make sure that firms stay true to these commitments, we track their impact through Portland Means Progress and annual reporting. Lastly, uh, before you are the full array of programs that help companies to scale, increase DEI and culture change efforts, or explore new markets, I just wanna call out that this is the work of our athletic and outdoor cluster liaison, Sucheta Bal. For over a decade, Sue has partnered with organizations like Business Oregon to take company to trade shows. She's worked a lot alongside companies such as Keen, Columbia, Omorpho, Handful, and many others to engage with industry talent as part of the ANO Professionals Group. She assists companies of all sizes in accessing loan products, information, networking opportunities, Portland Means Progress programs, inspiring diversity grants. So I really wanna thank you, Sue, and her manager, Pam Neal, for their continued efforts within this critical sector of our economy. So thank you, and I believe with that, I'm passing it to our colleagues at the <laughs> Thank you so much, Council uh, Mayor uh, Shea as well, Andrew Hone, President and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. I'd also like to acknowledge Sue Ball's work. She's just been incredible, along with Andrew Fitzpatrick from your office for setting up this experience. And also, really a personal note of gratitude, as this is the first time uh, as leader of one of Portland's namesake chambers of commerce that I've been able to come here to talk to you on economic matters today and geek out on these things. So I wanna also preface this conversation with the fact that as you all know, and I reiterate what we just heard earlier, that livability concerns are, of course, the most important priority for the business community, and that goes without saying. But we also need to focus on and discuss what comes next, economically speaking. And nearly a year ago, we started asking this question about how to build back better as a business community. And we do what business communities do well and what individual firms do well, which is to analyze data, to help drive decision making, and we have a long history of doing that in coalition with our sister business associations who sponsors analysis or economic trends and voter sentiment. We work with Echo Northwest, a trusted firm here locally, and we also pair that with voter sentiment data so we can express both how people are feeling and what the economic trends tell us. We do this to inform our board, to inform our members, to help inform policymakers and the general public. So everything you're about to see today is heavily abbreviated for time constraints, but I want to also acknowledge the short, shortcomings. We're constrained by our own resources, time, and of course the intrinsic bias and blind spots impacting diverse communities. 
I'm sharing these baselines so that we can all level set about the conditions of our regional economy. The information that you will see was first released in January, and it was tracking our recovery over the last year. And all this, this information is a little dated. Uh, there have been subsequent reports that have reaffirmed the trends that you see and the basic assumptions about our region. The first and foremost important one is that job growth is strong, but we have not recovered from massive losses and challenges from the pandemic, and we have massive economic headwinds. We track ourselves against peer regions. Salt Lake City, Austin, Indianapolis, and of course Seattle, just because we always wanna compete with Seattle. Uh, but it's important to note that before the pandemic, this chart that you're seeing here before you was inverted with Portland leading the way in job creation. And the new paradigm is Portland being in the back of the pack. This is because we have faced a marathon of crises and these have inhibited our economic growth and prosperity. This is not necessarily the result of bad policy we all know we were one of the first in and last out with some of the most significant pandemic restrictions. And this resulted in saving lives, and that should be celebrated. But this also had consequences. And this is the most illustrative, I believe, and important for this council to consider. And I'll just move this to make it more visible for all of you. This tracks our intra-regional competitiveness. Again, if you look at this slide, Portland, which is the green line at the very bottom in Multnomah County, now legs its sister tri-county regional economies in job recovery, like Clackamas and Washington County to the top. Again, before the pandemic where this was baselined, this was inverted. And now let's talk about how voters feel. Similarly, we paired this information with where we are as a community, and voters have overwhelmingly felt that livability has suffered. Residents of this region believe almost uniformly that our quality of life is challenged. And the reason this is important for a business community and economic development is because that is traditionally an economic value proposition for our region and for our economy. And equally so, another inversion point. Andrew, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Did, did they, just so I don't lose my train of thought, yeah. did they say what they meant when they said the quality of life the was question that, in terms of overall quality of life. It, yeah, this is a slide we've been tracking for some time. And it's his feeling. It's a question yeah. of do you feel the quality of life is getting better? So you, you might worse. have a different reaction. You, you might both agree the quality of life is getting worse, but you might have complete, you, your reasons might be economic, mine might be livability or something else. Absolutely okay. correct. I just wanted to clarify that. Absolutely. Thank you. Good Sorry question. to interrupt. And excuse yeah. me, while we're here, Please. do you have comparisons to other cities on, on that last? On this Slide. data, we don't. We do okay. track economic data against right. other regions, but on the sentiment, we do not. Okay, thanks. And this is a similar question here, actually, Mayor, to your point. We did ask the question, how do you feel in terms of your economic well-being and financial condition? And for the first time ever, since we've been asking this question for over a decade, voters feel worse about their economic futures than better. So much of these major issues may take a lot of time and persistence to recover, and we acknowledge the work that you are all striving to accomplish and help correct these challenges. So I just want to say thank you. And while we must stay laser focused on livability issues, it's important that we co-create economic strategy. Good strategies should be predicated on your strengths to help guide limited resources. And that's exactly where the private sector is from a policy standpoint. And I'm here to share what we believe is one of our greatest strengths and where resources can be applied to help drive sound policy and shared prosperity. The genesis of this report and the findings you're about to see were inspired by the thing that we've seemed to have forgotten that happened over the summer. The United States, for the first time ever, hosted the World Track and Field Championships right here in Oregon, the largest spectator sport in the world since the pandemic. And we also wanted to be part of the state and regional solutions to drive economic recovery and to work across the state in advance of change in leadership at the governor's office, the Senate, and the House. And we want to be clear as a private sector, we want to be unabashedly pro-Portland. So what is our economic strength and naturally occurring brand? It is the athletic, outdoor, team, and recreation industry ecosystem. And what did we find? A unparalleled, let me be clear, an unparalleled combination of talent, sporting events, outdoor recreation, athletic culture. We are a national leader in sports activity and culture that punches, and you'll hear me say this again and again, punches far above our weight, nationally speaking. So what is it? 
Through our research and conversations with stakeholders in the ecosystem, we defined it to include sporting goods, apparel, as well as rec and tourism industries. But it goes beyond that. Supportive services, such as fabric mills, legal, media, marketing, real estate, and leasing, and exercise facilities, and, and physical therapy. And where is it? This is not just a Portland thing. This is a regional matter that includes Bend and Eugene and far beyond. And what does this tell us? 43,000 direct jobs to these industries in Greater Portland and an additional 8,000 in Bend and Eugene, resulting in a study area of direct jobs count of 51,000 workers in this ecosystem. One thing that is even more astounding is that 3,100 businesses are part of this. That is a massive cluster of big and small businesses. And the growth rate of this ecosystem far outpaces the general overall economic growth rate for our region. For today, we will heavily emphasize the Greater Portland region, although this report contains in-depth looks at Bend and Eugene. Greater Portland is unquestioningly the hub of the ecosystem's activity within the study area. Employment in this ecosystem is driven by the industry leaders. You know them, Nike, Adidas, Columbia Sportswear. But there is substantial sector representation in events and recreation, tourism, manufacturing, and wholesale. Approximately half of the jobs in the ecosystem are in sectors that are generally higher paying and have a highly skilled workforce. And let's talk about those small businesses. Despite the role of the large industry leaders in the employment of individuals in this ecosystem, most of the firms are small businesses. 83% of the businesses here in the ecosystem have 20 or fewer employees. Mm. Prior to COVID-19, growth in the ecosystem has significantly outpaced Greater Portland's employment growth and remains so even after the economic consequences of the pandemic. Industry leaders, events, and recreation and tourism were the greatest drivers of job growth in the ecosystem prior to COVID-19, and events and recreation and tourism jobs, of course, have suffered during the pandemic due to the forced shutdowns and social distancing requirements, even while the industry leaders' employment growth grew further and other sectors remained stables, stable. While important to look inward, it's even more important to the earlier question, Commissioner Ryan, that you asked about how do we stack up against other markets? We benchmark the Greater Portland Athletic Outdoor Team and Recreation Ecosystem against Greater Salt Lake, Seattle, and Denver, which each claim as a function that they are hubs of the sporting industry, leisure, and lifestyle business sectors. So how do we stack up against these other so-called industry hubs? Let's take a look at that. Despite our, despite our smaller population size, Greater Portland outpaces each of these comparison regions in terms of the size, growth, and concentration of highly skilled, high-paid jobs in its ecosystem. Looking at all sectors in their economy, Greater Portland has a lower employment than these other comparison regions. On your left-hand side, you see the total jobs count. You go to the middle, and you can see that despite our smaller jobs economy, this industry sector has greater employment than all of our competitive re all of our competitor regions and a higher per capita job uh, percentage than our other regions as well. We're number one. It's okay to say that. <laughs> Growth in the greater Portland ecosystem surpassed that of all our comparison regions gaining nearly 10,000 jobs between 2010 and 2022. And Greater Portland's ecosystem has a greater concentration of high-paying, high-skilled design services that include the industry leaders, design services, manufacturing, and wholesale. In contrast, Salt Lake City and Denver and Seattle's ecosystems are dominated by lower-wage, lower-skilled jobs and events, rec, and tourism. Now let's talk about the workers. We found that Greater Portland has disproportionately greater concentration of talent in creative occupations such as art directors, commercial and industrial designers, fashion designers, and more. Our workers employed here by companies typically have more stable employment and earn more than freelancers. And this grew by 60% in Greater Portland between 2010 and 2019. 
In greater Portland, as elsewhere, these creative occupations are highly skilled and well paid. They earn higher salaries than the average of all sectors and employ an above average share of workers with a college degree. Simultaneously, many jobs are also accessible and offer low barriers to entry, such as in the manufacturing sector. And these jobs do not always require a college degree and offer more economic opportunity to a more racially diverse workforce. While 47% of Greater Portland's white workers have a college degree, only 33% of its workers of color do, a function of broader racial disparities that we all must work to address. With that said, manufacturing positions in the ecosystem are higher paying than the average wage in Greater Portland and are less likely to require a college degree. This ecosystem is also more diverse than the workforce overall. 30%, 33% of workers in sports-related manufacturing are non-white, although they constitute only 20% of the Greater Portland workforce as a whole. Finally, one of the most important findings in this report is quantified by impact of the ecosystem to the state. As you heard, we directly employ 40, 51,000 workers in the study area, but we create an additional 79,000 spin-off jobs for a total of 130,000 jobs overall. The ecosystem creates significant economic output for our state, generating $14 billion in direct output and an additional 14 billion, yes, a B, in indirect, induced output, totaling nearly $30 billion annually. And for government, it's key to hear that the ecosystem generates $1 billion in annual tax revenues to the state of Oregon from income and business taxes, equivalent to the educational cost of 73,000 students. So in summary, we can't ignore our economic strategy or risk a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity following a once-in-a-lifetime marathon of crises. Other regions are doing whatever it takes to collaborate with business. Other regions have increasingly turned to expressing their brand proposition, economically speaking, and frankly, we need to catch up. Our brand, what is it? We are the unparalleled leader in the sports, athletic, outdoor, and recreation industry clusters. And what are other places doing? Let's talk about it. Where I just came from, Brooklyn talks about the fact that they are the tech triangle. One of the oldest cooperative agreements amongst regions is in North Carolina, a bygone word in the research triangle now. For 70 years, they've been cooperating to advance regional economic development. And consistently, North Carolina is rated the number one place to do business. And yes, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is a place that defines itself as the water technology cluster and hub of the world. We need to tell everyone else who we are. And if you think that people know, I can assure you, coming here from another place, nobody knows. It's time to start telling the story, to focus on our strengths, and to advance regional cooperation. These are the organizations that contributed to make this possible from Bend, Eugene, and beyond. Very proud to work with all of them and to partner with our government sector allies who provide invaluable data to make this report possible. And with that, happy to take your questions. And again, thank you for listening. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Um, first, thank you for this presentation and um, thank you for this good news. Uh, um, at a time when there's often some um, challenging headlines when you wake up in the morning, it's uh, refreshing to start our day by focusing in on Portland's strengths. Um, and I have two questions today that speak to Portland's strengths and how we can um, grow them. Uh, first, do you have any advice on what this council should do in order to continue to support and grow uh, um, the sports uh, um, space in Portland? Yeah, absolutely. No, no specifics to give you other than to say, first off, the Prosper Portland has been doing this work. The city has been a leader on this for well over a decade. I think it needs to be further empowered to be provided that license to go forward and work outside of our region with our partners in Bend and Eugene to create a statewide paradigm about who we are because it will be in unity when we advance these thoughts to the rest of the world that we will be successful. So I wanna say first off, fully empower Prosper Portland to advance this work and to highlight that this is collaborative, that this is with the business community. We wanna do this together. If you go to North Carolina and you look at the way they structure the research triangle, every single government across 13 counties has an appointment to that board. Every academic center 
is a part of that board. And every major employer and small employer is a part of that organization. And it has proved that in collaborating, they can build economic success and prosperity that has been transformative over the past 70 years. So follow best practices and empower Prosper Portland. Thank you, Commissioner, for the question. I'll just add that as part of our inclusive economic development strategy, we're actually going to be bringing forward some specific cluster recommendations for athletic and outdoor Great. next month. So you'll see some, some of our best thinking with our consultants at RW Ventures. And just as a, as a small preview, we're, it, it really, um, Andrew just brought it home. It's about public-private partnership. It's also about thinking of the connections to research and development. We have some great partnerships with academia and thinking further around opportunities in the green space and the intersections with manufacturing in this cluster, thinking about materials, thinking about reuse, thinking about how we help our companies here be more competitive. There's a lot of opportunity in this space. Uh, great. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, one quick follow-up question, and I'll hand it back to my colleagues for additional dialogue. Um, maybe I'll start uh, um, with, with Prosper here. Uh, here we have a, a, a case study of a sector that's really going gangbusters here in Portland. We're punching way above our weight, as we've mentioned many times. Are there any other... Are there any lessons here that we could um, apply to different sectors of our economy? So, for example, if Portland wanted to become a leader in clean energy, for, for example, um, what does the sports sector teach us about how to do that well? That's an excellent question, Commissioner, and I'll have to again refer you to some specific industry recommendations that we'll have for all of our priority clusters. So thinking about green cities and how it relates to, to clean tech, climate tech, thinking about our manufacturing sector, our metals and machinery industry that we have here that's quite heavy and large, um, as well as just uh, thinking through um, other types of industries like our own film office, right? So I think it comes down to thinking about what are the levers in our economy that as the public sector we have the ability to influence. And so particularly I think of the success of this comes down to human capital. Right? We think about why companies are moving to Portland. Even with all our challenges, people are saying, yes, let's move to Portland and, and have our headquarters here. We have a tremendous um, wealth in terms of the talent we have in this city. And I think if we continue to focus on those key drivers, whether it's talent, whether it's um, you know, proximity uh, to research and proximity to academia or um, thinking about our, our spatial efficiency and getting people to these jobs efficiently, we have a lot to offer. Uh, thank you for those responses. Uh, very interesting, and I look forward to Prosper's um, future reports and recommendations on how we can continue to uh, support and grow uh, both our sports and ec economy and the other subsectors of our economies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll hand and it back I to just you. just want to add one piece just to add to this, and really ask the question on clean energy and just commend Commissioner Ruby on the work we're doing together on the clean industry hubs, but also that what's so interesting about these industries, they are inherently connected to the environment. You think about some of our leaders here in Keene and Columbia sports where uh, you go up to Bend, Metolius, if you're a rock climber, is the brand to use while you're going up the side of a cliff, I know personally. And so these things require a deep and intrinsic connection to nature. And while we're in a city and we depend on human talent, it is important that as stewards of the environment that those ethos get expressed by these businesses. And they're already there because it is why they're here. You can work in these industries and live the industry's lifestyle. And that's what's so beautiful about it in very Portland. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Shay and Andrew. Good to see both of you. I have to admit, there's a few things going on. So I uh, saw the headline of this report. And because it's Sportstober, I thought it was going to be <laughs> about all of that. And we live in a state for a sports fan because Beavers, Ducks, Blazers, Thorns are in the championship. It right. kind of doesn't get much better when you're a sports fan here. Anyway, racing all that, now I'm right-sized to what this actual topic is about. Uh, I wanted to say that I'm glad you're here and that you're focusing on something that I've had that experience as well when I've traveled. And I, like all of us, we have friends throughout the country. And they're always like, what? What's Portland known for? It used to be timber. What, what is it now? And so I start speaking to these uh, industries in the sports world. And they know about Nike, of course, but they're always shocked about the other ones. And so I really think it is smart for us to um, get that in. And just for the record, you're from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes, originally I, born and raised, and I just moved from Brooklyn to New York. <laughs> it may have been a coincidence. So those are your lived experiences, but I didn't know about Milwaukee and their, their water angle, but I'll be paying close attention to that now. <laughs> um, 
my, my question, and it's, a, it's one that I hear from people in this industry, is there are challenges with recruitment, uh, especially, and it just, and it didn't start in 2020, it was before that. Um, but I didn't really see any of that, and we all know that that's a big deal um, because these are global companies, and then I'm so glad you brought up the fact that there's tons mm -hmm. of vendors uh, that are connected to these larger mothership type organizations mm -hmm. that, that thrive our economy. Is there any data on recruitment? Would you like to speak to that? Looks like Andrew's about ready to come out of his skin, so it looks like he has something. Oh, to say. yeah. Very excited about it. that. Is okay. the, that's that's it. That is it. The talent angle here is the single most important. We know we have structural challenges related to employment. You know, the labor market will be challenged for well well nigh a decade where we had mass retirement by the baby baby boomer generation that is conflicting with a, a, a lagging growth in our natural population increases and in migration to the region. So we're struggling and we will continue to do so. But the single most important thing that our employers talk about is talent and the reason they're here as well. Uh, I'll let you know that during the pandemic, the only major companies to take additional office space in Portland were Arcteric, On Running, Lululemon, because they wanted to be here. So think about that. Who was expanding here and why were they here? They were here for the talent. If you talk to Keen about why they originally located to the city, it's because where they were originally from, they kept getting resumes from a 503 area code. And so I think it's our natural talent. And in fact, it's the thing that needs to be addressed the most starting at an extremely young age. We need to be talking to our public schools, our primary, middle school, and high schools about career pathways in these industries because they do not all require higher education and then to focus and align our higher education institutes to serve these industries better. There's already incredible focus by some of the four-year universities. And you just talk about the fact that the University of Oregon, to cite the ducks, is part of what's called the Human Performance Alliance, a global alignment of academic research institutions around human performance. It shows you where their heads are at, and we need to just catch up, align it, and focus at a much younger age. And that includes things like improving our facilities for our primary schools, middle schools, and high schools for athletics. Simple things like that will make huge differences about building a homegrown workforce that's more inclusive, more diverse, and reflects our community. So when I lived in Seattle in the uh, early 90s, through the 90s, I noticed that uh, around technology, there was such an interest with the University of Washington working with private sector. So it's no accident that there's been so much growth in that sector in Seattle. So is there a table that is having that same laser focus with higher ed and with private sector and government all in dialogue? You know, for, for you're, you're skipping to the punchline, I think, and, and reflecting back that that's what we need yeah. because it's been absent. And not just a table here in Portland, it's a state oh, issue. Oh, it's statewide. Right? I, I appreciate yeah. it. And so I think if we're going to establish something, it's about co creating something with our academic centers, OSU2. Right here in Portland has something known as the Center for Outdoor Economics. I mean, think about the fact that our, one of our flagship universities has a presence here focused exclusively on this mm -hmm. research. So I think what we need to do is step up to a bigger conversation that will wholly benefit this region and this city and set that table that you're talking about. And we've introduced legislation through the House Committee on Small Business and Economic Development led by House Representative Janelle Bynum to that effect. And so we're hoping to set that table up sometime through the legislative process in spring. And it's exactly what needs to be. Great. I know when uh, Commissioner Maps asked what we can do, it seems like we need to tap into that type of table with you. Absolutely. And I know that, that you said statewide, and I appreciated that, and I took note of that. And there was some missing, but are you also engaging with Southern Oregon? I go to Ashland, I feel like I have to instantly start running and be a part of the sport culture there. Yeah. And same when you're in Newport on the coast, so. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the one thing is we had time limited resources to analyze all this, but if you look at some things, I didn't know that the Seaside Beach Volleyball Tournament was the number two beach volleyball tournament in the world. Bandon Dunes is the most visited golf facility on planet Earth. Uh, you go out to Hood River and you can talk about the fact that they have kiteboarding as the, you know, absolute epicenter of that activity. So there are things that just were outside of our time bounded and resource limited analysis. But yes, absolutely. And then you go things like uh, fishing, which I'm not a fisherman, but I know that's a huge part. And it drives tourism, eco-tourism to our state, brings in dollars and helps with our tax revenue and grow the employment base. And that impacts outside of our urban centers. So this is a real urban rural bridge builder 
which we need more of. <clears throat> yeah. And just because I know a few people that a Hood to Coast uh, series is well established as a, as a big driver as well. Absolutely. And they're at the table, right? Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks for being here, both of you. you. you want to add? Yeah, I just want to yeah. build. I, Andrew nailed it. But I just want to build on the, on the initial part of the question around, around labor and workforce, right? So um, we do know, as, as President Hone said, these are higher wages, right? These are higher paying jobs. And so we might not see the same level of both attrition and trouble recruiting that we see in the hospitality and travel and in that particular sector or in manufacturing where, where folks are really struggling to, to see those jobs recover. Um, it also ties to workforce development. It's not just academia, but it's thinking of folks who don't have college degrees and how can we uh, you know, align our workforce development investments more with this traded cluster sector, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, so I, I just uh, want to get at something that you mentioned, Andrew. Thank you for this report, by the way. This, this gives us a lot of ground to build on. Um, so you said something very provocative earlier on. You said we're number one, and then you compared us to other cities, and then you said, but nobody knows what we're doing here. And I could not agree with you more. Mm -hmm. We are experts at telling the world what's going wrong here. And we absolutely are lacking when it comes to promoting the opportunities and leveraging the opportunities that are frankly still here. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do? You said we need to catch up, but then you didn't say what we need to do. What well, do we need to do? From I'll your just put this up for observation. You know, this model is nothing new where people express a brand identity for their region. All of us would say that the research triangle is literally a bygone word at this point, and it's true. They've been doing this for a long time where they tell the world what they are. We have those value sets like semiconductors and of course the sports, athletic, outdoor and recreation industries. So when I say that, it's just borrowing the playbook out of other regions that are doing this successfully. You go to Salt Lake City, they call themselves Silicon Slopes. I mean, it's just really, really smart advertising. Yes, they do. Yes, exactly. Yes, they have skiing there. And so I think that's an element of this. It's about having the resourcing collaborative to tell workforce and economic professionals and general media and awareness about our identity. And, and claiming that space is the most important thing. So, so let, me, let me jump to the chase here. Um, we just had a very prominent headquarters leave Portland. Yes. And they described it on their way out as a net negative to be located here in terms of recruiting and retention. So we need to address those issues. We need to be honest about them and address them. Mm -hmm and we need to market what's going well here collectively. But is there a table where we can put those two things together? Because I don't see it, to be perfectly honest with you. And I've, I've gone around and I've visited other cities, I've visited chambers of commerce, I've visited government. Um, you know, a few days ago, a bunch of us were in LA and we were hearing the frustrations that are being expressed on the recruiting and retention front, livability issues and whatnot. But what we also heard was that many of the solutions that are being championed to address those issues are actually being funded by the very same people who are concerned about the situation mm -hmm. in the first place. In other words, there are true public-private partnerships. Do we have that table here, and how can we be stronger partners in that effort? I think we what started. Would your recommendation? Yeah, absolutely. You take a look right here. Um, there it is. There's the starting of a table, and it is not entirely inclusive. It does not capture the full breadth and bandwidth of who should be around the table. It's just a starting point. Uh, and I couldn't agree more, but it was incredible. I, I have to say, it was one of the more rewarding experiences I've personally had since being here. We met monthly on this topic for a year to produce this report in a way that took a lot of input and a lot of hard work and that brought academic, government, private sector to the table. And, and here we are, and we have a lot further to go. So I think, as I mentioned, we would like to see a statewide table set up that's similar and akin to the way that this looks right here in front of you. I, I think it's essential. I mean, I, I, I was sort of leading. Yeah. You know, These were leading questions. Um, it's essential. And, and I'm, I'm energized by the work that this report reflects and what it implies in terms of where we need to go from here. Because where we need to go from here 
is we need to address the problems, and that's the role of government, working with our private sector partners. And then we need to have our messaging clear. What are we selling to the rest of the world? And how are we selling it? And I think those are two areas where I think we need to work more collaboratively than we have been. And, I, and I'm not speaking to your organization specifically. I'm using the general lowercase we collectively in this state. Um, I, just listening to you talk about all the number one opportunities we have here, the strengths we have, particularly in this cluster, and it's not the only cluster where we have some incredible competitive advantages, but we're not quite closing the deal in terms of really leveraging the opportunities behind those clusters. And this, to me, is the most exciting one in the whole, uh, you know, the, 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 just based on, on the projected growth rates. This is incredible. And somebody else mentioned clean energy, I think it was Commissioner Maps. Mm -hmm. um, no. I, I just I, want to I'd like us to really get behind some clear long-term strategies who does what, when, how, and how are we paying for it? We really need a clear, concise, actionable plan, yeah. not just a report. Mm -hmm. So where do we go from here? I, I just want to, I think that's right on. We learn by doing, right? We learn by doing, and it's also about building trust and relationships. I want to again call out Commissioner Rubio's leadership around climate tech and the relationships that were built across industry, community groups, academia, researchers on this trip, and it's continuing the work when we get back, right? And I think focusing on those key catalytic initiatives, if we can show movement, if we can show some wins, if we can partner on a federal application, there's gonna be lots of opportunities on manufacturing, on, on clean energy. Um, so if, if we set the table and we can get alignment and we can learn and build that connective tissue and muscle memory of working together around some key initiatives, I think we can do anything. Yeah, this, this is exciting stuff, good. Okay. Anybody else before we call for public testimony? I know we have a couple of people lined up. Thank you, gentlemen. Great, great report, great presentation. Uh, Keelan, uh, how many folks do we have signed up? Um, we've got four people signed up. I don't know that everyone's here. I'll call All right. everyone. Three minutes each, name for the record, when our amazing uh, clerk calls you. First up, we have Kimberly Horner. I don't think they've arrived. Next, uh, Alucard Taylor. Let's go to Evan Lee. Evan Lee, no. Uh, and finally, Mark Porras. All right, very good. This is. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mark CK. is joining. Oh, sorry. Okay. We, yeah, Mark, we just good had morning. to get him transferred. Sorry. Yeah, good morning. Um, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns. And I live in Northeast Portland. Um, and I have children who play sports here. Um, big fan of the, of the Portland Thorns. And I just want to um, point out that um, Mike Golub, who is mentioned in the stakeholder participants and acknowledgments, was recently fired by the Timbers organization for his roles um, in covering up the sexual misconduct by former coach Paul Riley, uh, and also in creating a toxic workspace. And I, I, I just wanted to, um, I, it, it seemed like Commissioner Ryan may have thought that uh, just based on the title of this um, item, that maybe this was going to be about sort of the timbers and thorns and accountability um, in professional sports um, and women's sports and even down to the youth sports level. And I just um, want to let the Portland Business Alliance know that I think it's important for you to hold the leaders of your organizations that are members of Portland Business Alliance, hold them accountable. Um, there, have, there is a uh, ongoing effort right now, um, onwardrosecity.org, uh, where the community is attempting to get Merritt Paulson to sell the team to the community. And I hope the Portland Business Alliance can back that because um, these teams belong to the community. And if the Portland Business Alliance can't hold uh, leadership of the organizations that belong to the Portland Business Alliance accountable, then the community should take these, or these, um, take these things over. So thanks for giving me a few seconds to speak here. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Hardesty. Any further discussion? Did you have a question, Keelan? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, please call the roll. Okay. Maps. Well, I want to start out today by thanking Andrew, Shea, Prosper Portland, and the Portland Business Alliance for this report. Um, there is a lot of good news in that document. 
that report reminds us that sports are a big part of our region's economic success. In fact, as we learned today, sports are a $29 billion a year business here in Oregon. And here in Portland, 9% of the jobs in our city have some connection to the sports economy. Um, that is great news. It is, as we've heard several times today, uh, this is an area where Portland really punches above our weight. Um, I also want to to, um, uh, express my gratitude for um, uh, learning about two issues which I look forward to following up on over the course of the coming months. Uh, first, I'm eager to work with uh, Council, Prosper Portland, and the private sector to implement the recommendations contained in this report. And second, I look forward to taking the lessons learned from Oregon's thriving sports sector and applying those best practices to other areas of our economy, like the clean energy sector. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I just want to thank uh, Mayor Wheeler for bringing this forward, also Andrew and Shay for their presentation, and all the staff at Prosper Portland uh, for this great report. It's really compelling information. It's really exciting uh, to see the development of this sector, and I think in our work with the, with the Clean Industry Hub, we'll be, we'll be watching this development, and I think there are some good things to learn from there, um, and it, it will be exciting to uh, put these things into action. Um, my 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 colleagues already mentioned it, so I didn't feel the need to mention it again, but I'll say here just uh, wanting to underscore the importance of partnering with higher ed. And these, they are de definitely um, a pivotal player in, in when, where we've seen healthy examples of, of this kind of cluster work um, that is branded. Um, and as a former uh, member of the Higher Ed Commission, they're very, very interested in helping to shape uh, and in pipeline development for our future workforce needs. And I know they'd be very interested in this conversation. So would love to see that happen and look forward to next steps. Thank you. I vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, Ashe, and thank you, Andrew. This was, that was a great conversation. I appreciate it, um, being a part of it. And I think Going forward, I'm excited for our city to be at the table actively. Um, we are the sport state. Um, that's just a you know a a throwing something out there to get the, the brand going. But um, like my questions and then the mayor who followed up, um, it's really as important for us to galvanize and uh, own what's ours. And that was compelling data to prove that. Uh, I look forward to being a part of that cross sector um, engagement. And because and Portland's got to take the lead because so goes Portland, so goes the state. So thanks so much for being here. I vote aye. Honestly. Thank you, Mayor, for moving this report forward. Um, I'm really looking forward to making sure we have a complete picture of actually the economic impact. So though we're talking high wages, what we know is that the people that work in the, in the stations and clean it up and actually uh, take tickets are some of the uh, most underpaid people who can no longer afford to live in our city. And so just highlighting the high wage workers, I think gives us a false picture of the sports uh, uh, arena, the sports uh, uh, industry uh, in totality. And I think we have to actually address all of those issues. Will workers be able, workers in these they uh, uh, are working in these in, uh, arenas and environments. Will they be able to live in a city? Will they be able to afford to go to a game? Um, it is not, it, you know, we have to look at the whole picture and not just take out the pretty pieces that make us feel good. And so I'm very happy to vote aye for this report, but I need more information how we make sure that workers aren't the ones that are being unduly impacted by these rich jobs at the top. I but I. Wheeler. Well, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking Andrew and Shay. That was a great report, great presentation. It's provocative. I think we could probably spend most of the day talking about it and its implications as well as the opportunities suggested therein. So thank you for that. Thank you to Prosper Portland and the Portland Business Alliance and their staffs for the considerable work that went into these reports, the findings as well as the recommendations for action. I know that this leading industry, as well as sporting events and recreational tourism, can shine a very positive light on the city of Portland. 
and play an important role in developing both investment as well as talent in our area, which ultimately will have, I think, the outcome of driving greater economic prosperity for all here in the city of Portland. With this report's insights as well as recommendations, we'll continue to seek opportunities to increase collaboration between public, private, academic, and non-governmental organizations to advance the athletic and outdoor industry in our state. And I will just close by underscoring the reality that this information, while positive, provides opportunity for us, but we actually have to do the work to leverage that opportunity. So I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues here, as well as Prosper Portland, the Portland Business Alliance, and other private sector organizations to best discern how we can do that going forward. This is one of our greatest opportunities economically, and we should absolutely capitalize on it. I'm happy to join my colleagues in voting aye. The report is accepted. Thank you. Next item, please, is item number 880, also a report. Accept the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report and the Parks Levy Oversight Committee Annual Report. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor, um, and good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm very excited to bring this item to council today to celebrate Portlanders' investment in parks and recreation. In November 2020, Portlanders approved the five-year parks local option levy and its commitments to prevent ongoing reductions to park services and recreation programs, preserve and restore park and natural par area health, center equity and affordable access for all, and more. Portlanders started seeing the benefits of their investment almost immediately with the return of programming in summer 2021. Thanks to the parks levy, Portland Parks and Recreation was able to restart outdoor recreation opportunities including camps, classes, and open swim for Portlanders of all ages in a COVID safe and equitable way. In year one of the parks levy, we're already seeing progress on each of the commitments made to Portland voters. And by year five, the Bureau will have grown with stronger partnerships, improved processes, and positive community outcomes. So we're very excited to celebrate today the investments made in year one of the levy. And one of the commitments to voters was to convene a Parks Levy Oversight Committee. And I want to thank the mo members of that committee for their work this past year, ensuring that the levy resources are spent meeting voter commitments in a fiscally accountable and also transparent way. So thank you to Alicia Blakely, Judy Bluehorse Skelton, Maria Velez, Paul Ar Agrimis, and Silas Anderson for your service. Your diverse perspectives and expertise have helped ensure that Parks Levy is starting off with a very strong foundation. And I look forward to hearing uh, the, rep the report from Judy Blue Horse Skelton, who is going to be the representative uh, later. Um, later. So I also want to thank uh, Portland Parks and Recreation uh, Director Adina Long and her leadership. Uh, Director Long will now introduce the reports being shared this year. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Hardesty, Maps, and Ryan. For the record, I'm Adina Long, Director of Portland Parks and Recreation. The Bureau's 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report and accompanying executive summary, as well as the Parks Levy Oversight Committee's report, covered the full fiscal year 2021-22 and share key actions taken in this past fiscal year to support recreation for all, protect and grow nature, and community partnerships. We have seen progress on and related to all of the com commitments made to Portlanders in the voter pamphlet. And year one of the parks levy has established the mechanisms to successfully deliver on voter commitments over the past five years, I'm sorry, over the five years of the parks levy and beyond. In fiscal year 2021-22, parks hired 1,416 full-time, part-time, seasonal, and casual staff restoring hundreds of jobs to meet parks levy goals, and created 142 new full-time equivalent positions, increasing Portland Parks and Recreation's capacity to provide services and programs to Portlanders. This increase in capacity will create living wage jobs while helping the Bureau meet the needs of a growing park system. The result will be cleaner parks, improved access to programs, increased care for the urban tree canopy, and a growing effort to center and learn from underserved communities. 
I also want to thank Portland Parks and Recreation staff who played a critical role in delivering programs and services. Their work cleaning parks, running summer camps and events, and working with community partners have been essential to the successful implementation of the parks levy. I'm going to turn it over now to Claire Flynn, who's our levy coordinator, who will present an overview of the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report. Thank you, Director Long. Good morning. My name is Claire Flynn, and I'm the levy coordinator for Portland Parks and Recreation. Today, I will present the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report. Following my presentation, Judy Bluehorse-Skelton, a member of the Parks Levy Oversight Committee, will present the Oversight Committee's Annual Report. The Parks Levy Ballot Title and Explanatory Statement outlined 15 commitments that the Bureau would do with Parks Levy approval and funding, and the report speaks to the actions, financials, and performance measures related to each commitment. To help illustrate the bigger themes, each commitment is grouped into one of three larger service categories, Recreation for All, Protect and Grow Nature, and Community Partnerships. In addition to tracking each of the commitments, the report also highlighted some key overall themes. First, the report highlights how the Bureau centered equity as this was a key aspect of the parks levy. Key examples here included the use and implementation of the Bureau's equity and anti-racism lens in decision making, establishing a continuous community engagement feedback cycle in the Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland strategic framework, and expanding the Bureau's equity and inclusion team including creating a new ADA coordinator position. As this is the first year of the parks levy um, and its implementation, we also made note of the ramp up nature of year one, specifically that as new positions come on board and programs are developed and implemented, more progress and impact is likely to be seen in later years of the parks levy. Finally, the Bureau used the leveraged funding model to spend parks levy resources, ensuring that the parks levy is an incremental resource. The Bureau, in partnership with the City Budget Office and the City's Chief Financial Officer, submitted a separate memo on the leveraged funding model to City Council on October 17th with specifics on lessons learned and success of implementation. As I mentioned, the 15 voter commitments are grouped into larger, ser uh, larger service categories, which are Recreation for All, Protect and Grow Nature, and Community Partnerships. Recreation for All is focused um, really on keeping facilities open, delivering programs, and reducing costs as a barrier to access. We saw commitment, uh, we saw success on all of these commitments. The Bureau was successful in preventing cuts and closures to recreation programs and facilities in fiscal year 21-22. The Parks Levy provided revenue support to help stabilize Parks budget when the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and associated public health guidelines remained uncertain. Throughout the report, we highlighted stories of staff, partners, and participants to show the impact of the Parks Levy. In this section, we shared the story of the assistant manager at Pier Pool, who came back to work after the pools and programs were closed due to COVID. She loves working with the community and was excited that PPNR was able to bring back programming in summer 2021. The Bureau succeeded in delivering recreation programs. Even with lingering effects of the pandemic and hiring challenges, PPNR served over 170,000 free meals, including 100,000 in the summer, and increased attendance in a COVID safe way. Parks is happy to continue to provide the programs that Portlanders love, like Teen Force, Summer Free For All, Nature Day Camp, and more. In fiscal year 21-22, the Bureau piloted two financial assistance models, pay what you can and the access discount. Through these programs, we provided $1.11 million in financial assistance to just under 8,000 unique users, significantly more than PPNR had provided in the years past. This was a big step towards making sure that recreation can truly be for everyone. The Bureau is moving forward with a model where users will register annually for what we're calling an access pass that will apply a discount automatically to programs and drop-ins. The commitments under Protect and Grow Nature include maintenance, tree planting, connecting Portlanders to nature, and more. The Bureau made progress towards all the commitments related to Protect and Grow Nature 
by planting more trees in priority neighborhoods, increasing attendance for environmental education programs, and purchasing a new volunteer management software. With more than 11,000 acres of land that include 8,000 acres of natural areas, PPNR's maintenance and enhancement of natural features is essential to climate resilience, protecting water quality and habitat, and ensuring ecological health in urban areas. PPNR created new maintenance positions that will improve the maintenance of natural features and areas. The number of invasive weeds treated annual, annually also increased in year one. Here we shared an interview with two North Zone Parks maintenance staff who spoke about how increased staff capacity on their team is helping them better maintain parks, be more creative with plantings, and adapt to climate change. In year one, the Bureau increased the number of environmental education part participants from the previous year and worked to engage and provide services to communities of color and children experiencing poverty working with Title I and Sun schools and local partner organizations for school field trips and to recruit students for environmental education programs. In this section, our lead environmental education staff members talked about the impact the Parks Levy has had on their programs, sharing that more staff on board means the team can better meet the needs and demands of the community and allows them also to work towards authentic engagement and breaking down barriers to participation for communities of color and households experiencing poverty. The largest portion of the parks levy spending this year was on enhancing maintenance and cleaning parks. We saw an increase in the number of open restrooms receiving daily cleans, an increase in the acres of invasive weeds treated, treated and percentage of work orders that are preventative. Additionally, the 68 new maintenance positions created this past fiscal year uh, that will also assist with general park maintenance, including emptying trash cans, cleaning uh, and checking restrooms, and preventative maintenance and repairs. As the city continues to face many challenges, park spaces are no exception. Increased usage of restrooms, garbage cans, and open spaces can increase maintenance needs. Enhanced maintenance as part of the parks levy is important to ensuring that parks uh, are maintained for all users. So I want to thank and acknowledge park staff who have continued to ensure that parks are clean and safe. Thanks to the park levy, the Bureau increased the number of trees planted in priority neighborhoods where canopy levels are lowest and where resources for tree planting are needed most to address existing inequalities. PPNR has also begun the process of building out systems for proactive tree maintenance in parks, a new level of maintenance that was only made possible because of the levy. In year one, the Bureau purchased a new volunteer management database that will help collect and catalog volunteer numbers and partner groups to better support increased engagement. Uh, we also made a $5 million one-time investment to upgrade the Bureau's work order system to increase efficiencies in maintenance processes. The community partnership commitments focus on transparency and oversight, community engagement and outreach, and equity. In fiscal year 21-22, the Bureau established the Parks Levy Oversight Committee. The committee meets quarterly and reviews information on progress towards the parks levy commitments, advises on transparency and communications, and receives topical presentations. Their role has been critical to transparency and public input, and we're very grateful for their time and expertise. PPNR implemented new programs, initiatives, and prioritization efforts in fiscal year 21-22 to center underserved communities, such as the new Community Partnership Program, which expands the existing Teen Collaborative Initiative Grant Program. PPNR awarded grants to 20 organizations to provide programming and services between July of this year and June 2024 to culturally specific communities and youth populations. In the report, we shared an interview with a Black Parent Initiative staff member who spoke about the work that PPNR has been doing to center underserved communities. Specifically, she noted the increase in culturally specific programming, partnership events, financial assistance, and early registration opportunities as being key to making Black Parent Initiative families feel welcome in PPNR spaces. 
In year one, the Bureau successfully delivered parks and recreation services to a wide variety of users and implemented initiatives such as early registration, community partnership program grants, and work order prioritization. Programs like Teen Force, Lifelong Recreation, partners, partnerships with the Black Swimming Initiative and Sun Community Schools, and more, ensure that PPNR provides opportunities to underserved communities. In this section, we share a story of a lifelong recreation participant who was able to continue to access PPNR programs during the pandemic through our virtual programming. Specifically, she doesn't have a computer and was still able to access programming through our partnership with Open Signal to broadcast classes on television. She's been attending Parks programs for 12 years and expressed gratitude for being able to continue to participate despite pandemic restrictions. Here is a high-level summary of Parks Levy funding spent in year one. The actual report breaks down the spending further by both the 15 commitments as well as listing out expenses by service area and work group, so we get to that more granular level. In total, at the bottom there, you can see the Parks Levy resources were able to bolster additional operating resources by about one-third to increase services and activities to meet voter commitments. Of the $60.5 million total spent on services and activities related to parks levy commitments, the parks levy funding supported about $18.73 million of that spending. Additionally, per city council direction in the ballot referral, the parks levy was required to reimburse the Portland Children's Levy for the amount of compression impact the parks levy caused the children's levy. So with that, the total amount of parks levy funding spent this year was $19.1 million. We're looking forward to sharing the Bureau's report and the Parks Levy Oversight Committee's report with Portlanders. Pending your acceptance of the reports, we will post the reports to the city's website. The executive summary of the Bureau's report and the full Oversight Committee report will be translated and available in the four most common languages in Portland. Additionally, both reports include information about where additional translation services are available upon request. With that, I will invite Judy Bluehorse Skelton to speak and present the Parks Levy Oversight Committee annual report. We're so grateful to have Judy's expertise and perspective on the Oversight Committee. In addition to her role on the Parks Levy Oversight Committee, Judy was previously on the Portland Parks Board and has been serving as co-chair on the Native American Community Advisory Council since its formation in 2011. She is currently an assistant professor in the Indigenous Nations Studies Department at Portland State University and also serves on the Center for Tribal Nations Advisory Council to OMSI, Affiliated Tribes of the Northwest Indians, and the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Thank you for joining us today, Judy. Thank you, Claire. Tots may we. Good morning. Thank you, City Council, for hosting us today. I'm excited to share the first Parks Levy Oversight Committee report, a response to the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report and Portland Parks and Rec's actions in fiscal year 2021-22. The Parks Levy Oversight Committee members are composed of five community members selected from an open public applicant pool and appointed by the PPNR director to serve two-year terms. We meet quarterly and review information produced by park staff. The role of our committee is to review information to verify general compliance with and progress toward the purposes of the parks levy, to advise on transparency and communication strategies, and to counsel on the annual report and future independent audit process. <clears throat> My peers on the committee are Alicia Blakely, Maria Velez, Silas Sanderson, and Paul Agramus. The first section of our report focuses on adherence to ballot language. By using the 15 voter commitments to organize the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report, Parks is illustrating its use of Parks Levy funds in ways that clearly adhere to the ballot language and making program decisions and actions that are in alignment. It is also important that Parks honor the spirit of the Parks Levy and use the Parks Levy to authentically build relationships and partnerships with the community that will benefit the Parks and Recreation System in the long term. 
Our recommendation is that the Bureau build on the success of year one and continue to use the equity and anti-racism lens and expand existing community engagement and feedback cycles to hear from the community how parks can build on parks levy voter commitments to best serve the community. We found that parks took care to be fiscally accountable in tracking and communicating parks levy dollars in a transparent, auditable, and effective way. We are supportive of the continued use of the leverage funding model as it clearly and transparently allows for maximum utilization of parks levy funding and deliver on promises made to voters, specifically providing incremental service levels over that of a baseline funding level with the general fund. Our final report section was about transparency. Parks has been responsive to the interests of our group, creating time and meeting agendas for topical presentations we've selected and sharing information on parks levy related initiatives in a timely manner. We love that the report includes actual stories from community members and staff and we are excited about continued engagement strategies to center the voices of underserved communities, including opportunities to continue highlighting people's stories in their own voices and appreciate the proactive work of park staff to meaningfully engage community partners and individuals. I want to thank city council for their continued support of the parks levy and look forward to future years of success. Katsiyaoyao. Thank you. With that, I'll pass it back to Claire. Thank you, Judy. We're excited about the progress made in year one of the Parks Levy and are grateful to the support of the Parks Levy Oversight Committee. That concludes our presentation. So with that, I'll open it up to questions and discussion. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony on this item, Keelan? No one signed up. Very good. Any further discussion? Excellent report. Please call the uh, Actually, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Hardesty moves. Second. Second from Commissioner Ryan. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio and the Parks Bureau for this report. I'm glad to hear that the implementation of the parks levy is going well. For these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank Director Long, um, Claire, and Judy for presenting the 2021-22 Parks Levy Annual Report and the Oversight uh, Committee Annual Report. Um, I also want to recognize the staff who've delivered the programs and services that have made year one of the Parks Levy successful. Um, park staff have also been absolutely critical to this successful implementation of the levy, um, and also they've been very um, uh, critical in supporting our city during challenging times. I want to particularly thank the frontline staff for their service during the pandemic. Um, also, because of the levy, Parks is now providing cleaner parks, improved access to programs, increased care for the urban tree canopy, and a growing effort to center and learn from underserved communities. This progress sets the stage for continued success in the coming years, and for these reasons, I'm very proud and happy to, to vote aye. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Director Long, uh, Claire, and Judy. And also for the meeting we had, I think it was about a week ago, the, the briefing was great. Um, I especially liked uh, what you, some of the slides that you showed, the accountability with uh, by the numbers, Park Levy Year One. Very attractive, very easy to read, very <laughs> blunt and clear. Thank you. And I also want to just acknowledge, I know we heard from a couple of your staff members earlier, those in parks and recreation that have been out there serving our community <coughs> um, daily when many um, haven't been able to go outside or don't want to go outside because of some of the conditions. So um, I know we've had dialogue about that and it was just refreshing to have it directly from some of your employees this morning. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a tickle. Um, I also want to just acknowledge that the voters said yes during a tough time and we appreciate their investments. And I think a lot of us could say there's a collective mental, mental health crisis um, in our community. And I know for me, if it wasn't for doing walks in my local parks, and especially when we are locked in, it was, it was, it was a lifesaver. So um, thank you all for your service to our community always. And I'm so glad that Portlanders love their parks and they're investing in them. 
and then you're making good on the promise. I vote aye. Hardesty. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, Director Long. Um, a very uh, well put together report and report back. I'm especially pleased with the executive summary. They're not normally that easy to understand and um, to extrapolate the information that you need. So very well done. Very happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Well, the public should feel well served by this. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio and your team as well as all of our amazing Parks Bureau employees, Director Long, thank you. Uh, an important part of any ballot measure is making sure we do exactly what we said we would do. And this report demonstrates beyond any doubt in my mind that you are being exceptionally good stewards of the taxpayer's largesse. So thank you for that. I imagine that will continue. I have no reason to believe it won't. And so thank you for your great work. I vote aye. The report is accepted. Colleagues, I've had a request. We take our break a little bit earlier, so we'll take a 10-minute recess. We are in recess until 11.15.
Everybody, well now to go to our third time certain item number 881, please. Accept the Technology Oversight Committee quarterly report. Colleagues, I'm pleased to introduce this report by the Technology Oversight Committee, which is comprised of five members of the public, each selected by an individual commissioner. The committee is tasked with providing oversight on the city's technology-based projects. Here to present the report are Ethan Surma from the Office of Management and Finance, Jeff Baer, who is here, the Chief Technology Officer and Director of the Bureau of Technology Services, and Wilford Pinfold, committee member representing uh, myself as the mayor. Welcome, Ethan, Jeff, and Wilfred. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. Good morning. This is the third quarter report for the Technology Oversight Committee. Um, currently, we are overseeing two projects, the Office 365 project, uh, that's run by police, and then we're also overseeing the INFOR project, which is a partnership between Water and BES. Uh, the Office 365 project is in the home stretch. It's going to be prioritized right now um, but uh, the body worn cameras project and the records management system projects will ramp up. We talked about those a little bit in our previous report. They will be ramping up as Office 365 shuts down uh, and, and is finished. Um, uh, in September, the INFOR project gave us a brief intro, uh, and we are going to be working with them and overseeing that project in the future. We haven't started yet, however. Today, uh, Jeff Baer is the Chief Technology Officer. He's actually there, and he's the Director of BTS. Uh, he's going to present the actual report to you. And then Committee Member Wilfred Pinfold, who is your representative, Mayor Wheeler, uh, will be giving the opinion of the committee and the reflections of the committee. So with that, I will hand things over to Jeff. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for the introduction, and good morning, Mayor Wheeler, members of City Council. Uh, as Ethan noted, I'm Jeff Baer. I'm the Director of the Bureau of Technology Services, and with me today virtually is uh, Dr. Wilf Pinfold, who is Mayor Wheeler's representative on the T Technology Oversight Committee. And Wilf and I are here to present the TOC quarterly report to Council covering the third quarter of this year and provide updates that may not have been captured during the reporting period. And of course, we're always happy to answer other questions that you may have. Uh, just to focus briefly on the Police Bureau's implementation of Microsoft Office 365 product, it continues to make very good progress, and our external QA quality assurance firm, Case & Associates, actually moved their project assessment to an all-green status for scope, schedule, and budget. And also the Technology Oversight Committee has also moved their project assessment to all-green on all those uh, different areas as well. And you may recall the previous report to Council uh, that was here for the previous quarter, uh, we had indicated that the schedule was noted in yellow, so there were some watching, careful watching over that, but that has been 
and is now indicated in green. And where, we're, where they're at today is in the pilot phase, and which includes a small number of Bureau staff to test, train, and migrate the emails to the Office 365 platform. And this will serve as a testing ground before we move to the full migration and deployment uh, early next year, as Ethan indicated. So there, I'll pause there. Uh, Wilf, did you have uh, comments you wanted to share with the Council on the <coughs> Office 365 deployment? Um, I agree completely with your assessment. I think we felt uh, when it was yellow that we didn't really have enough information to mark it as green. We now have that information, so we're feeling very confident uh, that it's moving ahead well. So uh, fully agree with you, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Wilf. And also the Technology Oversight Committee also heard updates from the Portland Police Bureau staff on the body-worn camera project and also the police record management system. And additionally, the Bureau of Environmental Services and the Portland Water Bureau uh, we just saw this pr past month on their uh, overview of the INFOR public sector project that will consolidate two different uh, asset management sy systems on a common platform. And some other projects that will be seen, uh, I think, coming up here shortly for the TOC consideration. Uh, we were also working with the Bureau of Environmental or Bureau of Emergency Communications on their uh, 911 dispatch system upgrade. And also, we've got two larger projects on our SAP platform. One's the Ariba platform, which is the procurement portal, and also the Success Factors Employee Central. So. Uh, we've got a, a number of different things that are coming up soon. Uh, also at the November Technology Oversight Committee meeting, we've also asked uh, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, Kevin Martin and Hector Dominguez to provide an update on the work that they've been doing. I think they've shared with you at the City Council at work session on their surveillance policy. So we wanted to give TOC over insight into how that is being put together. So with that, I'll pause. Uh, Wilf, any other additional observations you'd like to share? No, I think I think I agree on that stuff too. I think we're very eager to see it. I'm looking forward to seeing the 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 drone and the and the surveillance policy, uh, the next meeting, um, and um, very happy with how things are going at the moment. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Wolf. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and present the quarterly report, and especially your support for the Technology Oversight Committee. And here to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty has a couple of questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jeff. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Wilford, as well, uh, for being here to answer questions. I'm worried that our fabulous Technology Oversight Committee is taking on a lot of projects in a very short period of time. You are the technology experts, and I'm concerned that we are overwhelming you with a lot of different projects that require different levels of expertise. Uh, the police uh, updates alone should, would be normally your full agenda for a year. And so what do you need from this council in order for you to be able to, your team to be able to volunteer their time to actually give us a meaningful and relevant information? Uh, Wilf, yeah, like, uh, sorry, go ahead, Wilf. Oh, I, sorry, sorry to butt in there, Jeff. Um, we, we are not feeling overloaded at the moment, uh, Commissioner Hardesty. We uh, were the, the Office 360 program has been our major focus, and that's, uh, I think, now well in hand. Um, but uh, as the other programs come in, um, you know, we'll see how that workload goes. I agree that this is important work, uh, and we won't, we won't let it uh, pass, pass us by without getting proper review. So I appreciate your concern. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And as that work comes in, we'll we'll make sure that we have the, the adequate time uh, to review those. Sorry, Jeff. I well, I appreciate you saying that, but I, I just want to be clear. We're going to be depending on your recommendation around a lot of these technology issues. And I don't know that you are deeply enough involved with what, say, for, as an example, uh, the police bureau is doing around body cams. Your report says that there's still negotiations happening, but we don't have a body cam policy. So I'm still not quite sure what we're negotiating without a policy in place. Um, and and uh, even with the, tech, the surveillance uh, work that you're talking about, it will be far after the horse has left the barn where you're going to be coming back with recommendations on surveillance. So again, I'm just, I, I am concerned about the, what are we prioritizing? Um, especially as we are addressing these new technology issues that we're going to spend millions of dollars on investing in. So that's kind of where I am right now. And again, I, I, you guys have always just done above and beyond. 
uh, and uh, I use the word guy generically because uh, we've got some awesome women on our uh, technology oversight committee, uh, but you've always provided us with some really awesome early information and I feel like I'm not getting what I need right now early enough uh, for it to be able to inform policy decisions that I will be asked to make. And I may be asked to make those policy decisions long before you come back with your recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, and really appreciate the concern as well and, and hear you on that. Uh, one of the things, two things, one is uh, the on all these large projects, we require an external quality assurance firm to come in, and they are really deeply embedded in the project team, and they present their findings each month to the Technology Oversight Committee. So it's a way for the, the TOC members to really get that inside view of what's happening on the project at the ground level. So that's really instrumental in helping them to understand what's happening on a, on a, on a very uh, down into the weeds uh, basis. Uh, the second part is I would really encourage each of you to reach out to your Technology Oversight Committee member. They can provide some great expertise and insight and help you think through some technology issues that you might be thinking of yourself. So uh, they're there and available uh, outside of the normal report to council and also, you know, they're just a great uh, resource to tap into. Do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed it. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to accept the TOC report. So moved. Commissioner Hardesty moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. I want to thank the Technology Oversight Committee for their work and uh, this report. I'm glad to hear that the Police Bureau's conversion to Microsoft 365 is on track. Um, and finally, I want to express my gratitude to the committee for keeping a close eye on the Water Bureau's and the Environmental Services Bureau's implementation of new asset management software. Um, I will be following your future findings with interest. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank you, Jeff, Ethan, and Wilford, and the committee for their great work, and I'm really happy to support this. I vote aye. Ryan. Jeff, good to see you. Um, Ethan, Wilfred, thanks for your service, and I vote aye. Hardesty. As always, <clears throat> excellent information. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, Ethan, and Wilfred. I'm happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Well, I want to thank our presenters today, Ethan, Jeff, and Wilford, for joining us to present this report. And thanks always to the members of the Technology Oversight Committee for their fantastic work in helping us better understand where the potential tripwires are with some of these technology reports. Really appreciate it. I vote aye, and the report's accepted. Colleagues, to the regular agenda. The first item on the regular agenda is report 894. Accept bid from Kemper Sports Management LLC for five-year contract for clubhouse operations at Colwood, East Moreland, Heron Lakes, and Rose City Golf Courses for an estimated cost of $40 million. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. For more than two years, the Portland Parks and Recreation Golf Program has experienced a significant increase in golf rounds while playing an important role in Portlanders' physical and mental wellness during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, Portland Parks and Recreation golf courses were filled with patrons able to socially distance and connect with friends, family, and the outdoors. The golf program intends to build off of this increased interest at our public golf courses and welcome the next generation of golfers and visitors to its facilities. To achieve success at the golf courses, Portland Parks and Recreation relies on its clubhouse operators who provide various golf services for visitors to operationalize its vision of a more accessible, diverse, and inclusive system. This item today will serve as a pivotal next step in creating that vision. In March 2022, Council approved the Chief Procurement Officer to facilitate the use of a competitive solicitation to obtain the most responsible and responsive offers for golf clubhouse operations for Colwood, Eastmoreland, Heron Lakes, and Rose City Golf Course courses. Although the proposers had this, the option to bid on one course, a combo of courses, or all four, all six proposal responses the city received included bids for the four for the all four courses included in the solicitation. The solicitation also requested a vision and operating plan that demonstrated the proposer's differentiation as a course operator and how they can provide greater accessibility and equity within the golf program. 
I will now like to introduce Jess Klein in procurement to provide the report to council. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name, uh, for the record, my name is Jess Klein. I am a procurement services uh, manager for goods and services. Um, as authorized by ordinance uh, 190729, the city of procurement, uh, procurement services issued RFP 1854, seeking proposals for qualified firms and contractors to provide clubhouse operations at Colwood, Eastmoreland, Heron Lakes, and Rose City Golf Courses. This included managing and operating all golf and restaurant operations, documenting compliance with appropriate laws and regulations, and implementing an agreement that will fulfill the values of the City of Portland and achieve the financial and programmatic objectives of Portland Parts Golf. On June 27th, 2022, six proposals were received, uh, and each uh, bidding on all four of the golf courses included in the solicitation. Proposals were evaluated over multiple phases in accordance with the RFP requirements, and on August 15th, 2022, a notice of intent to award uh, to Kemper Sports Management, or KSM, was issued. A protest was received on August 16th, 2022, and was resolved. Kemper Sports Management uh, business tax registration account is in full compliance with the Equal Benefits Program and the EEO certification requirement. The level of confidence in the cost estimates for this project is high based on historical financial data and the pricing received and negotiated with Kemper Sports Management. The Chief Procurement Officer recommends that the City Council accept this report and authorize the Chief Procurement Officer to execute a contract with Kemper Sports Management for an initial term of five years with the City's option to extend for up to five additional option years for a total of 10 years. The total, uh, the not to exceed amount for the initial term of five years shall be up to $40 million. <coughs> Uh, this amount covers the reimbursement to the contractor for operating expenses incurred on behalf of the city, as well as management fees for conducting golf operation services at the golf courses. All revenues produced at the golf courses included in the contract flow directly back to the city. Funds for the contract are accounted for in the golf fund budget and the five-year forecast for the golf fund. Thank you. I, I am available for any questions. Very good. Commissioner Hurtis. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you so much for that report. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I'm sorry, who's the gentleman sitting next to you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, hello, I'm Maximo Behrens. I'm the Recreation Services Manager for Portland Parks and Recreation. And so you're probably the one that can answer questions specifically as it relates to golf courses. Um, I can assist with that, and we also have our, um, I believe, joining online is uh, Vincent Johnson, who is our golf manager as well. So my, qu my questions are less about procurement and more about golfing in the Portland metropolitan area. So I appreciate the RFP. But I'm just curious, how many people annually use our five golf courses to golf? To golf? Uh, in uh, fiscal year 2022, we had roughly 270,000 golf rounds uh, played. Uh, that doesn't account for folks that show up to use the driving range. Uh, that use our event spaces, which have been not as utilized coming out of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, but and just the kind of uh, incidental uh, stop buys. But golf rounds is, is very uh, uh, tightly tracked, and that was roughly 270,000 rounds. 270,000 golf rounds. And as you can tell, I'm not a golfer, so I have no idea what that means. Can you tell me what the demographic breakdown is of golfers who utilize the five golf courses that the city of Portland owns and operates? Yeah, th that data, um, one of the things that we're looking to do a better job of is having better data capture. We don't have great data uh, on the demographics. Uh, a lot of programming has been, in the last uh, number of years, uh, has been uh, um, revolving around g making golf courses more diverse and getting more uh, more of our con diverse uh, communities to our properties and uh, through through that programming. Uh, I will say generally, you know, golf uh, historically has been um, a more, you know, predominantly white sport. And that's something that uh, we at the local level are working on, but something that the industry is, has been working on um, for, for the last number of, uh, of, of, of years to, to diversify the game. Do you know of any golf programs in any of the public schools in the Portland metropolitan area? Yes, there's a lot of youth programming. Uh, high school golf, a number of Portland public schools have high school golf teams, some of which we uh, support at uh, our golf courses. Um, but there's also youth programming. The first C of Greater Portland 
which is a great partner of ours, uh, Leisure Hour Junior Golf Program, which is a historically black uh, golf program so that we also support. So there's a lot of youth programming available uh, to, to get uh, young folks onto our golf courses. And what is the average cost for a golfer to come and golf on one of these public golf courses? Uh, that depends, and I, I think, so uh, I say it depends because uh, I think, you know, the experiences, so for instance, uh, some can come and hit golf balls for five or six dollars. Uh, youth uh, at East Moreland uh, can actually hit a small bucket of balls uh, for free from six to nine a.m. every morning. Uh, so for some, that is, a, that is their golf experience. Um, on the golf course, uh, at the top in um, uh, at our golf courses, uh, which is Heron Lakes, it's $52. But $52 per, per, per time you golf? Uh, but I wanted to give context to that is uh, we have different pricing for time of day, day of the week, and also time of year. So when we get into our shoulder seasons and winter seasons, it's, it's uh, less expensive. And also um, at uh, Colwood Golf Course, which is uh, our newest acquired property in 2014, uh, which is predicated around trying to make golf more inclusive, uh, building a better on-ramp uh, to golf. Uh, that is uh, $18 to play, but there's also a practice course that we also utilize greatly for our youth programming and for our, our player development. So there's a lot of uh, free and low cost opportunities and programming, um, as well as different pricing throughout the year. I heard you talk about a shoulder season and a winter season. So on average, how many months a year can people actually golf in the city of Portland? Uh, it, it's a year round playing season. Uh, granted, when the weather is worse, naturally, like a lot of other activities, they reduce. Um, that is similar with golf. So on really poor days, uh, you'll see fewer, fewer folks playing, but folks still come out. Um, during our, our peak season, obviously, our courses are full um, uh, very busy. So, uh, but, but yeah, we have a 12 month playing season. Vincent Johnson, thank you very much for your very specific answers to my very specific questions. I'm very grateful that you were here today to answer those. And my question is more for my colleagues. This afternoon, we're going to be here until 11 o'clock tonight, I hear, talking about our housing affordability crisis. At a time when we own five golf courses and we have thousands of houseless people, I just can't imagine locking in golf courses for rich people or for people that have privilege uh, for five years with another five-year extension. I think we should be looking at taking two of our golf courses and temporarily repurposing them so that we can address this uh, humanitarian crisis on our street. And I was just kind of surprised that this afternoon we'll talk about houseless people, but to this morning we're talking about protecting golfing for another decade. Uh, so that's why I had the questions. I appreciate the, uh, the patience with my questions. I'm done. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions for me? Hey, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah. I don't really, I don't golf, so I, I'm following up on that question about the rounds. You said 270,000 rounds, and I didn't hear, maybe I just didn't uh, hear it right, but does that mean there's multiple people per round, so it's like 270,000 times three people average, or is that the no, amount of uh, people? That, that's, that's, uh, that's total rounds. Um, uh, that's total rounds uh, played, yes. Total rounds per person, not like there's three, four people golfing, and that doesn't count as one round. Correct. All right, got it. So it is 270,000 people. Got it. Thanks. Is that what he said? Commissioner what? Did I just confuse you more? Yeah. I just confused Commissioner Hardesty more. I and said it just the opposite, actually. So I, you said 270,000? <laughs> he said there's 270,000 rounds. So I was asking the question, is that per person or is that a round? And a round, what I know, includes sometimes multiple players that like four people play together. Mm -hmm. So I don't I think just people play golf to, alone, do they? I'm, you and I don't know much about golf, so I was just trying to get um, Vincent to give us the clearance. I've, I've played yeah. alone because I suck, and I don't want anybody <laughs> to see me hitting the ball. Well, that's not the norm, though, right? Vincent, could you please clarify the answer? Yeah, that, that, that is total rounds. So that is including whether someone played alone or in a group, but all, all rounds in, uh, included in that number. Yeah, because Vincent, if I was answering your question, I think I would have said 
it, the average per round is three point X people, but you're saying what? It's oh, well, it, so yeah, golf groups are uh, a max of four. That's for the sake of uh, timing right. um, and safety. Uh, during this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we and and coming out of it, uh, those those are are often that's what the case is. So I don't have an exact count of of how many available tee times and if they're filled by four people. But if you so, let me <laughs> let me let me help here. Let me help here. Okay. So let's pretend I have three friends. I know this is fantastical, <laughs> but let's pretend I have three friends, and I want to golf in front of those three friends. So the four of us go to a city-owned golf course, and we sign up and we play, my three friends and me. Is that one round or is that four rounds? Yeah, that's four rounds. That is four yeah. rounds. Thank you, yes. perfect, thank you. And again, that was a highly hypothetical scenario I was just painting for you all. Uh, who else has a question? Commissioner Rubio has a question. Uh, thanks, Vincent, for being here. Can you talk a little bit about, you had, you had shared earlier on with me, um, did you have a question? Oh, um, uh, you had shared earlier on with me uh, a little bit about your visioning for making golf courses more accessible for the family. So if whether or not you play golf, there are going to be other opportunities to access and enjoy the park. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, um, you know, generally, yeah, we're looking for those opportunities. So some of that's going to be, you know, through that programming. Um, and uh, so, you know, for example, uh, we did have a community day out at Rose City where uh, uh, Summer Free For All came out and had a concert and we had uh, community folks uh, um, attend that day. Uh, one thing I just would want to say is we, we also um, had a great support with the community members there. We had a steering committee comprised of neighborhood association folks, Rose City Bluff volunteers and golf advisory committee. So I had a really a great time working with them and it's something that we're looking to, to expand upon uh, to, to continue to provide uh, more access and opportunities for folks to uh, enjoy the space. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mapp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Vincent, I'm not much of a golf. In fact, I'm not a golfer. I haven't been out for decades and decades. Um, uh, on the other hand, sometimes on a week on weekends, especially when the weather's nice, um, and I got like a 13-year-old and a 12-year-old, and part of me thinks, ah, maybe I should try to get the kids out and play golf because we have these, uh, you know, uh, really special resources. So if you're a Portlander, especially a Portlander with a couple of kids, and you want to maybe explore golf, how would you even start? Well, uh, one is to know where our facilities are, but we do have websites for each one of our golf courses. So they do provide a lot of information on how, uh, what's available at the golf course. Uh, but ultimately, you know, that's one of the, the things that we're looking to do better is to make folks more aware uh, about uh, what is available and how they can get into that. But uh, that's ultimately what it would take. Um, you know, you can re reserve tee times online, uh, but also there's a, a great staff at all of our golf courses that can help uh, address the, the needs that you have. So whether that is uh, at the very introductory level uh, or someone that's more advanced that's just kind of ready to go, but uh, they're there to help uh, serve those those needs. Yeah, yeah, so this is kind of an opportunity to do a public service announcement. If you're if you're kind of interested in golf, haven't really done it before, you want to start, that uh, you should first begin by finding a golf course near you and then giving them a call to find out yeah, how to yeah. begin. Yeah, that's right. And, and one, one of the things, you know, we, we have five facilities, uh, four of which are being considered, you know, uh, with this uh, RFP process, uh, but they are uh, geographically spread out uh, pretty evenly throughout the city. Uh, and so that gives an opportunity for folks to uh, be uh, not have to travel as far to uh, to access those golf courses. That's one of the things that's that is that helps make our program uh, more effective is just the distribution of where they are. Uh, so folks uh, have that access. Great. Thanks, Vincent. And just, just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, Vince, you don't need to own clubs or, or anything, do you? you? You can get those there at the golf courses? No, no, you don't need that. And I, I appreciate you kind of raising that. I think there's a, there are some misconceptions. And again, another thing that we're working on is for folks, you don't need golf clubs. There's no dress attire. You know, these are public spaces. And, uh, and you know, there are even, uh, so for instance, you know, using the practice areas are free, not the driving ranges for adults, uh, but uh, um, 
um, outside of the time that I mentioned earlier for juniors. But the point being is that, uh, yeah, that you can show up and you can have a golf experience and staff there will help you. So there's no knowledge that you need other than to show up and they'll be happy to, to help anyone out. Great. And, and I'll turn this to Commissioner Hardesty in a minute, but I'll, I'll just note um, my daughter loves to go to Top Golf. And she does not play golf, nor does she have any interest in learning how to play golf. But she loves top golf. And I think there's something to be learned there, particularly for this next generation. Because every time I take her there, it's packed, full of young people. And so they, they've really captured the zeitgeist of the moment, technology, gaming, outdoors, athleticism, uh, combining with other people to have fun. And, and I, I just think about what the future of this sport might be. And I realize that's a niche market, but I think it's one we should pay attention to. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. Uh, is that like, a, a, what did I used to call that, putt-putt golf? <laughs> no, it's, it's a driving range. Oh. But I would actually say it's golf meets oh. gaming is probably how I would describe it. It's, it, it they, they have an electronic gaming system and so you can actually hit the ball and it's aimed towards virtual targets that you can see on a screen. It's, it's actually pretty remarkable. We, so, we should do a city hall day there and have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, my last question is really around, um, uh, uh, I asked about demographic data and you told me you weren't quite capturing that data, but we, we can agree that this is predominantly a white male older sport, at least it has been my entire adult life, and I'm only 65 years old, so I, I don't think that's going to change much in my lifetime um, as, as that sport. But again, I, I'm looking for how do we create opportunities for everyone to share, especially when we talk about the magnitude of land that we have on golf courses. We don't use all the land we have on golf courses to play golf. I, you know, I walk golf courses as exercise, and that's fun. Um, but again, we're talking about our, our, uh, the city being in an emergency, and we should be looking and acting like we should use any land we own uh, to help our most vulnerable people. So I'm done. Thank you. I did Thank have you. a question, but then I decided not to. No worries. Uh, do we have any public testimony on this report? Yeah, we have six people signed up. Very good. Uh, three minutes each, name for the record. Uh, first up, Brian B.J. Swearer. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, you don't, you, the, oh, the mics good. are very oh, cool. sensitive. Thank you can just leave it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is BJ Swear. Um, I've been a area resident actually out of Vancouver since uh, 2009. Um, I've been golfing at the golf courses since then. I've probably played around 700 rounds of golf, roughly on the city courses. Um, I actually worked for uh, Kemper Sports that manages Hannon Lakes. I was there for 10 years, uh, most recently as a tournament director. Um, I'm also a uh, co-owner and uh, executive director of Golf PDX. We were one of the bidding firms in this RFP process. Um, and I'm also still currently the tournament chairman with the Heron Lakes Men's Club. Um, I've been doing that since 2015 when I was on staff and then also continually for the past two years. Um, the club itself has 378 members. It's the largest public men's golf club in the entire uh, state in the OGA, which is the, re the governing body. Um, and so I'm, I'm partly here to represent them. I'm partly here to represent um, my company, which was literally established to try to better the system um, going through this RFP. And then just as myself, as a golfer, um, I'm out there. I would have been out there today. We have a men's club tournament that's been going on. Um, despite the weather conditions, we still have 50 guys out there playing golf. Um, but I felt that I should be here as opposed to out playing. Um, I'll keep my time short because I have a minute and 40 seconds, which, you know, was three minutes is the amount of time that you get to look for your golf ball on the golf course. That's the rules. So you, you, you gave me the time to find a lost ball here. Um, I submitted written testimony. Um, hopefully it, it's read, it's there. It's pretty self-explanatory. I covered the, the protest process that uh, we, Golf PDX, engaged in. Um, and at this point, you know, the decision's left with you, the city council, whether or not to approve this contract going forward. I'm not gonna get it too into the details, it's unnecessary, it's, it's in what I've 
given um, from Britain. I could go on and on and on about the, the importance of the golf program. Uh, honestly, 2020 was the best thing to happen to golf since Tiger Woods and graphite shafts. Um, it's been great for the game. The game's been exploding. Um, even though rounds have gone back down, it's, it's been amazing. Um, I'm out there, our membership continues to increase every year. Uh, more and more people are participating. And I'm not rich. I have not a lot of money. Um, a lot of the people that play at the municipal courses, that's why the municipal courses exist. They can't afford memberships to go to Columbia Edgewater and Royal Oaks and Orchard Hills. They go and they play the municipal courses that are supposed to be affordable for the common person. Despite the increased rounds, despite the increased participation, rates continue to climb every year. Um, it's unfortunate. It's pricing the people out of the market who would be playing there. These are just some of the things, the vision that, you know, Golf PDX, us local people tried to bring for this RFP to have a change from the status quo, which is a large corporation coming in, taking $400,000 a year of money that's not going to benefit Portland. Thank you. Appreciate your being here today. Next up, we have Robert Bodine. Welcome, Robert. Doesn't look like Robert's here. Uh, next, we have Stephen Betchik. There you are. Hi, Stephen. Hey, hey, thanks for having me here. I'm uh, um, mostly here to testify about the RFP process for the management of the golf courses. And I, I know we're at uh, the 11th hour, as they say, uh, because the the contract to manage the course is going to expire in, in, uh, on November 1st. But um, I, I question the process that was given. The, the city has not released um, the scoring evaluations for all the RFPs. They haven't provided the uh, public access to the final bids. Um, and it seems like it may have been a predetermined uh, decision because Kemper Sports, which is pending having the award, has been managing Heron Lakes. They've been doing a reasonable job. I play there, um, so I can't complain about their service, but Golf PDX is provides local management by local golfers. They're local people. They play the courses that they're gonna manage versus a corporation, Kemper Sports, that's headquartered where? Phoenix or something like that. So um, I would just like to encourage the council um, to consider a few options. One would be to extend the current contract for at least 120 days to give the public access to what the proposals were. And beyond that, consider splitting the management up of the golf courses amongst two or more companies. Uh, Kemper is the only one that's been doing it. Um, the other courses, uh, East Moreland and Rose City have been managed by private people for almost 40 years, if you consider the Cumstons out of, out of East Moreland. So let multiple management companies have at it, create a little competition, see who does a better job of managing the course, managing the expenses. Golf PDX is the less expensive option uh, and they can return that money to the facilities to, to make them better and, and possibly subsidize rounds to get people interested in playing in golf. So I was, I'm really amazed that every no one on the city council plays golf. I, I, it's, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me. But having said that, you need to know that the city of Portland has among the best public golf facilities of any country, uh, city in the country. I've played them. And for us to consider using city golf course land for anything other than golf would be to tear down uh, something that Portland could be proud about. At East Moreland Golf Course, they play the U.S. Public Championships. These are these are high quality facilities. So, um, lastly, two things: please consider reevaluating the RFPs for the management, and please don't tear the golf courses down. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next up, we have Tom Williams. Hi, Tom. Hi, good morning. morning. Uh, my name is Tom Williams. I live in Foster Pal, and I'm a member of Portland's Golf Advisory Committee. Uh, the Golf Advisory Committee is a commissioner-appointed, non-paid citizen committee that advises the golf director and golf program on golf program-related matters, including strategic direction and contracts. 
I have been a golfer off and on since I was a child. I value the sport because it provides me with outdoor recreation, a healthy way to let off stress and connection to community. My educational background is in urban policy and I recognize the great value that a good and accessible municipal golf courses provide to the communities within which they reside and to their entire city. The city of Portland has an outstanding golf program. The city's collection of, has a collection of excellent golf courses that are welcoming, affordable, and centrally located. They provide a great way to get healthy outdoor exercise in a beautiful setting. Portland's golf program puts a lot of effort into making these courses accessible to everyone of every age, every sex, every background. Compared to other publicly owned golf courses I've played, the city of Portland's courses are noticeably more welcoming and diverse. This is one of the reasons why I choose to primarily play at our city's owned golf courses. Our golf courses here are a great community asset. As a member of the golf advisory committee, I support this proposed contract with Kemper Sports Management. I believe it is in the best interest of the golfers, the golf program, and the city of Portland. The thorough process that led to this bid centered the needs of the city's many diverse golfers. I believe this contract will lead to greater access for golfers, will make the golf program more financially sustainable, and will ensure access to Portland's golf courses to all the people in our city. I believe having this contract in place is key for our city's golf program's long-term success and ability to provide affordable access to this valuable recreational opportunity to anyone and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Delfino Baltazar. OK, uh, next, Timothy J. Dack. Hello, Timothy. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Appreciate it. If it pleases the council, I'm Tim Dack. I am the president of the Heron Lakes Men's Club. <laughs> I've been a member of the Heron Lakes Men's Club since 1992. Um, I've been on the board for 21 years, not consecutively, but I was first on the board from 1995 through 2004 in the capacity of tournament chairman, um, president, and then vice president. I came back to the board in 2011 as a Saturday captain, then president. I left in 2000, after 2018, took 2019 off, came back at the end of 2019 as president. During that time period, um, during my time period at Heron Lakes, I've experienced two different, two different uh, managers that you have employed. Byron Wood was the original, and then Kemper Sports. Um, from my perspective as, as uh, president, I, I want to thank you for letting me be here today because this is the first time I have been involved at all in this process of awarding this, other than spending an hour and a half, might have been two hours, with the consulting group that you hired um, on the Friday before Memorial Day in 2021. <laughs> and we did that as um, what, we, what that entailed was um, members of each ladies and men's club for the four courses, don't include uh, Colwood because they don't have a ladies or men club, um, speaking to the consultant group. Um, I've read the consultant's report. I don't necessarily appreciate being uh, their term for us, um, but what I'm here to tell you is that what you're spending with Kemper Sports um, for them to collect money for you is far and away too much money for them simply to collect money for you. I have been at this facility for almost 30 years now, and I will tell you that in the last 11 years that I have been uh, involved in dealing with Kemper Sports, I have yet to see them do anything that enhances the golfing experience for anyone at Heron Lakes. And that is unfortunate, because Heron Lakes is one of the top golf courses around. I will tell you, my men's club has probably some of the top amateur golfers in the state. We had one gentleman qualify for the US Amateur Tournament this year. It's a national tournament. You have international players to try and qualify for that. Two of them qualified for the Mid-Amateur Tournament, the USGA Mid-Amateur Tournament. We have quality golfers, and they will tell you they have played courses all over, that the four finishing holes at, on Great Blue of Heron Lakes are some of the best in the world. What I'm here to tell you is that my experience with, with Kemper Sports is that they will take your money, they will collect the money for you, and that's all they're going to do. In the 11 years I've been back on the board working with Kemper Sports, I haven't seen them enhance the golfing experience for anyone there, and that's a disappointment to me. Again, I didn't get, a, I wasn't interviewed for this process at all. 
it's disappointing to me that this is my only time to say this because it seems to me that it's a little too late and a little too short. But this is the only time I had to do that. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thanks for making that Thank effort. You. That completes testimony. Very good. Colleagues, any further discussion or questions? I just have Commissioner a question. I, I wanted to ask uh, Vincent and uh, uh, maybe Maximo or just to comment on the procurement process and did you, in fact, review, review that after hearing concerns? For the record, my name is Jess Klein, uh, Procurement Services Manager. Um, okay, a uh, couple things. Um, so I think probably the first thing to talk about is the evaluation committee that was for this uh, procurement. Uh, one of the things that we heard was that you know there was a there was a, a, an appearance that you know predetermined around decision making. Uh, the committee was made of six members. Uh, that's actually unusual. Normally we would only have five, but in this case we had six. The reason why we had six is because only three of the committee members were city staff. Three of the committee members were actually community members two of whom were members of our minority evaluation program. Uh, this was a desire from uh, the golf team to be able to actually get out there and expand the group of people who would be looking at this work. My understanding is that three of the uh, two of these uh, committee members were also members of the golf advisory committee. Um, so there was a desire to bring the community in on this decision making. Um, the, uh, so far as the records around the procurement are concerned, um, we have received a number of open records requests around this procurement. We have released all records um, which have been requested at this point. That includes proposals, that includes score sheets. In fact, the score sheets are actually currently posted um, with the uh, requisition that's online. Um, the only records that are not been released at this point are protected under trade secret, the trade secret exception and ORS 192501. Um, so unfortunately, you know, due to that trade secret exemption, we aren't able to release that at this time. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I would say uh, uh, one note uh, to be made, um, and this actually comes back to the, the, the protest uh, which was made, um, there was an error in the original scoring, uh, and that, sc that error was corrected almost immediately. Um, it was, uh, we actually, <laughs> It was actually we were trying to expand uh, the, the point values for the co-bid certified firms. Uh, so typically whenever we go to bid, we only award um, eight additional points for subcontracting to co-bid certified firms. Um, there was a recognition that we needed to be able to both recognize the prime or the subcontractor on this, uh, on this proposal. When the, uh, the original formula that was used though unfortunately only had the subcontractor formula. Uh, we were reached out to by Golf PDX uh, uh, once the scores were posted, and they let us know that, you know, wait a second, we should have some additional points here. We were able to make that adjustment to the scores, um, which did increase Golf PDX's score. Um, however, the evaluation committee uh, unanimously decided to not move them forward in the process. What? Go they ahead. they, they uh, remained in fifth place, Commissioner. Very good. Colleagues, any further discussions? I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Commissioner Rubio, any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for bringing this item forward. <clears throat> Um, colleagues, I'm struck by the fact that we started today talking about the role that sports plays in Oregon's economy, um, and then it was very fascinating to get a, this case study about um, the role that golf plays in our civic life here in Portland. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for being such a good steward of recreation and parks in uh, Portland. Um, I also very much appreciate the conversations we've had with folks who um, care about the game of golf and want to make sure that we get this right. Um, and I encourage and urge uh, the Commissioner Rubio and the Parks Bureau to continue to work with the golf community to make sure that we manage our, our courses in, um, in a in efficient, equitable, and fair fashion. Um, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. 
Um, I like. I would like to thank uh, Jess from procurement and Maximo and Vincent for all the work that they've done in this process. Um, I also want to thank those who came in to testify about their concerns today. Um, I, I, we, we hear you and we take those concerns that were raised seriously. Um, and I also want to appreciate that there was a second look at those pieces um, um, by staff to ensure that there was f fidelity to procurement rules. Um, and also thanks to Port Portland Parks and Rec uh, Golf Program for their hard work and diligence to see this project to fruition. We'll be watching to see how this moves forward. And I'm happy to accept this report. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for those of you that came to testify. I, I'm sitting up here with more questions and answers at the moment. Um, I, I didn't get the sense of what was broken and what needed to be fixed. And I just need to say that. It seems like we're moving from one contracting system to a new one that Kemper's going to take over all of them. Is that true? Uh, yes, Commissioner. OK. And so I didn't understand why we made that decision. I, that's, I didn't hear that. I know I spent some time just trying to understand the demographics, trying to understand how many people are golfing in Portland. I, I support the golf courses. I know at Heron Lakes, it's, it's been a game changer for many students at Roosevelt High School. Um, but at this moment, I know it's just more of a concern vote. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and vote no. I vote no. Hardesty. I'm really grateful that Vincent Johnson was here. Thank you so much for answering my questions, uh, very specific to golf and the vision of golf for the city of Portland. I'm also really concerned about this. Uh, I'm concerned about this for a couple of reasons. As stated, we're in a state of emergency, I understand, um, and we are protecting golf courses and not protecting people. Um, I understand that this process was a little funky when it comes to whether it was appropriate to give all the golf course management to one company versus uh, the system we had in place before. Um, and so I am a no vote uh, on this particular measure. Wheeler. So just uh, for, for clarification, and, and perhaps to put Commissioner Hardesty at ease, there is no city-owned property that is off limits when it comes to the question that we'll be talking about later this afternoon. And I will reserve the right to use my authority in the issuance of executive directives as I see necessary. So I, I just want to put that on the table as Aside, aside. Um, I want to thank everybody who testified. I honestly don't get into the nuts and bolts of our golf program. Uh, I have focused on other priorities, and I'll freely admit that, but I probably should. Uh, this is the second hearing that I've attended related to golf, and the passions run deep. That may just be emblematic of the game itself, of the pastime itself, of the sport of golf. Um, but I actually would like to know more about the hydraulics of this. And a gentleman said he was surprised that, that none of us up here at least played golf. I used to, and, and I, I was being unabashedly honest when I told you I, I was terrible at it. Uh, then I suffered a catastrophic back injury and I couldn't play it at all. And so I, I just really haven't been to a golf course, but I would like to spend a little bit more time with you at a later date to really talk through some of the issues and maybe talk to some of the folks who are here today uh, who are so passionate about what we do and how we do it here. Uh, I will vote aye today. I'll defer to the Parks Commissioner and the Parks Bureau on this point, but I, I think we need to have a deeper discussion about this contract in particular and how these contracts are vetted. I vote aye the report passes, though barely. Next item, colleagues, is item eight number 895, which is a resolution. Declare City Council support to form stakeholder advisory groups to support post-pandemic economic recovery in the central city and neighborhood business districts. Colleagues, the work of the expediting groups is about aligning complementary efforts across business districts and neighborhoods. It's a way to identify common trends that challenge us and those where we have success. 
and it's important for the city to be fully participatory as a partner in moving forward economically. Improving the right-of-way, increasing residential opportunities, and improving on the public safety perceptions across our various districts and neighborhoods are shared goals, and they're directly related to the economic recovery of our small, medium, and large businesses here in the city of Portland. The spirit of the expediting groups captures what has long made Portland special interested people coming together to work through small and big issues with a desire to make our city livable, make our city unique, and make our city a place where people can thrive. For those reasons, I'm not only grateful to the stakeholders who are helping this effort, but I also invite my fellow commissioners to support this resolution and to commit to supporting the business districts all across the city of Portland. I'll now turn this over to Eric Zimmerman on my staff to present the item. Good morning, or good, good afternoon morning. as the case may be. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, Eric Zimmerman, Senior Advisor for the Central City. And I think we have a presentation that is up, thank you. Um, you know, the expediting groups are a convening of active stakeholders and participants across the various business districts in the city. The concept uh, has grown from the successes that we have seen in the various problem solver meetings that many of our neighborhood associations participate in with PIMO. We can go to the next slide. We, we've designed two expediting groups in recognition that the economic challenges facing the many business districts across the city uh, as they come out of, the 20, of 2021 and have just completed a summer season that showed the beginnings of a recovery. These expediting groups will work together to address the barriers to improving the vibrancy and the vitality of the various neighborhoods and their economic corridors. While the needs across the city's neighborhoods may differ, many of the trends are generally common. Developing solutions and sharing those solutions across the business districts and across the neighborhoods is intended to help us as a city know where we can align efforts and ensure that we're a complementary partner in the economic recovery of Portland. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight uh, on this slide the, some of the differences that Prosper Portland and Eco Northwest have identified within the central city uh, districts and the economic corridors across the city. In this first table, their study helps us identify the trends relative to the number of businesses, the amount of employment, office vacancies, and the foot traffic contained within the central city districts. And whether it's stabilizing, growing, or a loss from pre-pandemic eras. Go to the next slide. And they, they further the same idea. Uh, this next table rec uh, offers us some recommendations to approach the needs of various districts, uh, given their stats from that previous slide, uh, where we have the ability to take a look at whether we reinvest, whether we reinvigorate, or where we recognize. And with that, it may include very near-term investments. It may include increasing residential uses and incentives to mitigate some of our most challenged areas. But working to activate the public realm or increasing daytime activity in areas who are recovering but just need a little bit of reinvigoration to truly thrive is another set of recommendations that we can see. If we go to the next slide, the uh, Prosper Portland applied these same standards, not just in the central city, but across the economic corridors that complement the business districts throughout North and East Portland. And again, uh, the reinvest, reinvigorate, and recognize recommendations are really what drive us as we figure out where the expediting tables and expediting groups can, can contribute. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. To ensure that we're engaging in a meaningful way across the entire city, We've really uh, introduced this expediting concept to the business districts across the city and are pleased that most of are willing to participate and their idea sharing is already beginning relative to success stories and the common trends that they're facing in this environment. So given the last few maps that we've seen on the slideshow, um, I've been able to kind of tell you where we're focusing and kind of the how we're focusing, 
but I want to take the opportunity to move to the next slide and show you kind of what we're going to focus on within the expediting groups. In our conversations with the expediting group stakeholders and in reflection upon that economic study provided by PROSPER, uh, we've shaped the work of the expediting group into four primary buckets. And that's what you get from this very acknowledged, very busy slide, but that's what, you, <laughs> that's what we're hoping to convey here. Uh, you see returning workers, you see right-of-way improvements and activation, you see an increased housing opportunities, and underlying that are public safety improvements. What I'd like you to take away from this slide and from the effort overall, really, is that these efforts are primarily focused on short and medium-term actions that can have a real effect on the ground. We hear in every stakeholder meeting about real and perceived concerns about public safety and how it affects whether people want to come back to the office, whether people want to come down to shows, or whether people choose to dine out. And we also hear from retailers that they need help knowing what to do. They need help knowing what to do when they're robbed or vandalized or harassed in their places of business. And so because of that, we've established the breakout group uh, that is focused on public safety uh, as a foundation for these efforts. Another one, and as noted previously regarding foot traffic, uh, remains depressed in some of our districts. And as we recognize some of the challenges of, of the workplace over the last couple of years, we also recognize that many employers and many employees are trying to figure out the best ways to create a model for the future of work. The expediting group on this topic is leaning into the concept of how to create a vibrancy that can be felt when people are working from the office but are enjoying that flexibility uh, that we've experienced over the last few years. And what does that look like in a hybrid environment moving forward? For those efforts, we created the, the uh, breakout group for returning workers. And now, I think most of us have noticed a need for cleanups in some sense in the right of way to make our streets feel more inviting or more open. Uh, Pimo and other partners are already aligning their graffiti abatement cleanup efforts to focus on areas of great need. And businesses are already in talks with one another on how to expand the holiday tree lighting uh, along our sidewalks and the removal of some of the protective plywood to make room for temporary pop-ups, uh, pop-up vendors, art exhibits, and holiday showcases as we move into the winter season. You'll notice that these are truly, when I say short-term, these are the short-term ground-level activation efforts that make a difference in that, great, in that sense of the feel of our streets. Uh, and in all of these various economic corridors. Uh, particularly as we enter into the darker months, lighting up our streets and some of our parks where possible is gonna be felt for more hours of the day. And we think that that will have an effect on the right-of-way activation moving forward. And lastly, in recognition of the change of the workplace and the vacancies that we have heard about that exist within commercial spaces, we are endeavoring to better understand how we can make it possible to use those spaces for future residential uses. From the previous tables, we can see that districts that have a greater mix of mix and density of residential units are faring better than other than areas with low residential opportunities. Those conversions, if possible, require that the city be a partner. And for that, we created this last breakout about increasing housing opportunities and the actions that we can take as a city to help in the medium term, uh, take now to help the medium term growth in residential opportunities. So I offer that. Uh, these are the various efforts that I would say are already happening within the community. And it's our belief that their impact will be felt at a greater, uh, a greater pace or a greater effort if we strive to align all of these efforts together and if we achieve complementary outcomes relative to these economic districts that then affect our neighborhoods. And that really is where the concept of the expediting group is coming from. And so with that, we can go to the next slide. And I am very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions on this item? I got a question. Commissioner Hardesty. 
Uh, thank you very much, Eric Zimmerman. I think it's the first time you've testified in front of us. It is. Thank you for being here. So how are participants selected for these uh, expedite groups? Yeah, initially it uh, has been from the business districts. We put out an invite at Venture Portland. And then from there, we've also asked uh, members of commissioner staffs if they have other folks that they think should be invited. And we've extended invites that way. Sure. And uh, then in cultivating from uh, some of the, I mentioned the problem solver meetings, some of those problem solver meetings, which are neighborhood associations and others that are involved, uh, some members there have shown an interest in being involved as well. So is, are these members going to be confirmed by the city council? Uh, I don't believe that this is a, an act where they need to be confirmed. It's more that they are participating on well, I'll call like a working a working group, and there's it's it's not that people can't participate. It's uh, we have regular open meetings where folks are allowed to attend, and and uh, I think that's why there won't be any confirmations in that sense. So, is this a public meeting? I think right now it falls in as an advisory within uh, the mayor's office, and but I would say to really answer that question fully, I think that. Uh, we should confer that with the city attorney's office to, to answer that fully. But right now it's advising the mayor's office. Well, if they're advising the mayor on redirecting resources, then I would assume that this council would be affirming uh, their appointment. Um, I did read that any office could participate, but most of us have seven staff. You guys have 25. So it's a little hard for us to participate in all these meetings that uh, your office has. How many of the small business owners that are participating have 20 or less employees? I don't know the answer to that, Commissioner. How diverse are the business interests that you've been meeting with to develop this scheme, this plan? Uh, can you repeat the beginning of that question? Yeah, what is the diversity? How, how equitably uh, is the representation at these tables that are providing input to the mayor's office? Yeah, I, I think we have a diversity of types of businesses businesses that are involved. We have the diversity that reflects the membership of the various business districts that and membership of Venture Portland. How about of the city of Portland? The diversity of the city of Portland? That is correct. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question that you're asking. That's okay. I'll ask my next question. Okay. Is there a, this an attempt to put those action tables that I was supposed to be briefed about two budget cycles ago uh, into statute? Is this what this is doing, putting those action tables into statute? Commissioner, I think that this, this is about uh, efforts that many in the community are already taking relative to trying to figure out how to get through and how to improve their economic situation into the winter months. Mm -hmm and that if they're able to take some of those actions at a very personal and, and, and single business level, that they may be complementary to what their neighboring business is doing or what their neighboring association is doing, and that that effect is a desired effect that has, uh, that brings shoppers back to, to their streets or is everybody on a single block projecting that they're, they're cleaning up what has been dirty on their sidewalks. I think that's really more the spirit of this and it's a, it's a collective buy-in of, of neighborhoods and of business managers, business owners, um, that there are some things that they can contribute to together that entice shoppers, entice people, diners to come back to their area and maybe overcome some of the real or perceived uh, issues from previous months and previous years. How much staff time is being taken away from bureau staff uh, to participate in these tables or to redirect their work uh, to accommodate these tables that so far are unnamed who's at it and unnamed what their input is and how their input is being used? I'll answer that. Because um, I, I think there may be a fundamental misunderstanding about what this actually is. So 
all of those proposals that we just saw that were in the three different nice buckets. Circles, yes, th this is actually coming to us from the community. This is the neighborhood business districts, in some case, neighborhood associations, small business owners and operators advising me, my team, and Prosper Portland on what they're doing and what support they would need from the city of Portland. This is a resolution, so there's nothing here that's statutory. There's nothing here that um, is in stone. This helps me be advised as the commissioner in charge of Prosper Portland, uh, writ large economic prosperity and returning back to some semblance of normalcy economically. This gives me clear insight into what is going on at the neighborhood level, as a, in addition to what kind of support ultimately they might ask us for as the city council. But that would all have to come back to city council as part of a budget request, uh, as part of the work that Prosper Portland is doing, uh, as part of the work that we're doing through the Inclusive Business Resource Network through Prosper Portland. All, all of that is secondary. This is really us setting up tables so that we can understand what's going on at the neighborhood business district level and be supportive, be catalytic to the efforts that are already underway. I appreciate that explanation there and that makes me a little, just a tiny bit more comfortable in what is being proposed today. I guess my concern is, though, Mayor, you think Prosper is, in fact, our economic development engine, and I would hope that we're not limited to just what we think Prosper can do, because most communities of color do not see Prosper as an economic partner when it comes to their economic stability in this community. So I, I, I always get concerned when we have backroom tables that are having conversations that need to be bigger and broader around economic development. Again, we always talk about my people's market, but black people have to eat more than twice a year, and it may be a good flagship program for Prosper but it's not actually having any economic impact that black small business owners desperately need uh, when we're helping the city of Portland. And a great example, 82nd Avenue, East Portland, uh, it is a vital business district that gets almost no support at all, and I also don't have street lights and sidewalks, and I won't say that I have the $4 billion maintenance backlog that Commissioner Ryan loves to hear me talk about so often. So I really appreciate, welcome, uh, Eric, your uh, first time testifying in front of us. Thank you, Mayor, for that explanation. It's always better to be more transparent than less. Thank you very much. So I, I, I'd like to add to that. I, I might challenge you a little bit on some of the assumptions. We can take that up during budget. Um, but in, in fact, we're doing substantial work to engage entrepreneurs as well as small business owners and operators of color, both through the Inclusive Business Resource Network at Prosper Portland. That provides technical assistance, uh, in some cases grant support, siting support, storefront support, and other services for over a thousand small business owners and operators per year, the majority of whom are uh, business owners and operators of color and women. Uh, secondarily, we also have our inclusive business recovery strategy meetings underway. We had our fifth meeting yesterday. That is a broad coalition, again, advising me, advising ultimately the council, on what strategies we need to put into place to ensure that we are being equitable in our approach to economic recovery and making sure that those very businesses that you mentioned are being included uh, intentionally and upfront. And, and those meetings are going very well and I appreciate that the commissioners have offered support to that effort as well. Oh yeah, of course, Commissioner Ryan, sorry. That's all right. Uh, Eric, good to see you. Welcome to the team. Thank you for your report. Uh, just a, one uh, question is just logistics. The, the West End, how, how do we define, I always thought that was just part of Central City. Um, explain a little further how that little narrow three-block yeah, area uh, uh, has its own thing. I've also learned this as well. Right. <laughs> so Share um, just really from a, from a Central City perspective, uh, in, I use that term now really to, to reflect what was shown on the first map, which is that's the Lloyd, Lower Albina, in, Inner East Side, and then areas in the downtown district, and it is one of our historic uh, designations in, uh, and I say that 
historic in, in the amount of time we've called it the West End versus downtown or, or the university district. These have all been batted around as similar areas. Um, so I think really the, the folks who uh, represent a lot of the downtown, I think you see the coverage in what is defined as the West End here. Um, another very key player for us is the university. The PSU is a, is a big participant in these, in these talks, and they also have students who are very much in that West End as well. So I think what we're seeing is a difference between colloquially how we call certain areas versus what, uh, you know, like Prosper and Eco Northwest define certain districts. And tell me a little Excuse more about the ecosystem of what you're building, the choreography, if you will. So these yeah. groups that are defined with these breakouts like West End, I'm assuming they meet, and then is there a collective meeting with all of them coming together? The, the, way, we're, the way we're organizing this is right now, uh, all of the central city is one expediting table because of this, how much density is in that together. And then we're creating another uh, expediting table that encompasses the business districts across the rest of the city. And that's where some of those economic corridors come in to play. And that's what, uh, what we get is almost a, a similar amount of folks involved. It's just that there's so much in the central city uh, that that number in a smaller geographic area still is a lot of folks. So what they do is uh, those that very busy slide that had the four breakouts is that there are people who are involved who are passionate or or knowledgeable on those given areas and we're holding uh, weekly or semi-weekly meetings on that specific topic um, and then there's another group that maybe other members of the expediting group who aren't passionate about that maybe so they're they're involved in right-of-way activation but they're not involved in public safety for instance and so they don't engage in that extra meeting um, and so there are only a few people who really kind of dance in both or multiple groups. Um, but it, it allows those who are passionate, knowledgeable, or have a vested interest in a specific topic to get a full hour each week. And then I know there are conversations happening uh, amongst themselves because they hear of ideas that then spur that on. And a, a great example of that is that in our right-of-way activation, cleanup and activation group, there are um, there are neighborhood associations who talk about their cleanup efforts that are going on, but at the same time, they are uh, hearing about opportunities where the the street trees that are in the blocks along those those in front of those businesses could maybe expand and be lit up during the during the winter months, and so they kind of identify themselves as being interested in that. And then we have an art uh, and some constituents from the art community who are interested in helping some of the vacant window spaces. Uh, they learn that a business is open to maybe a short-term tenancy and or or some sort of like window activation and they're looking at how to get those places activated on the ground floor the way we kind of remember from the holidays past that happens in those organic meetings right and that's really valuable but another thing we learned out of it is that we learned that um, the businesses were challenged in how to engage with Prosper Portland on the you know, we have the fund that helps them if they get their windows smashed. There was a lot of misinformation out there. That same group identified that misinformation and we're helping get that back out there and correcting the record, if you will, and making sure f folks know there are funds available. You should apply still to get that help. So that's why I make the tie to some of those problem solving meetings that there was some stuff that is very reactive, but there's also an aspect of these expediting groups that's trying to be very proactive and they're learning lessons from one another and that's the convening role of these and that's where it's been really helpful. Your, your example is very concrete about the activating the um, business. Um, I forget what it was called. I remember wanting to be a champion for it, but through Prosper Portland, so mm -hmm. they would have access to those funds. Yeah. How will I, on council, how will the public uh, know six months from now how those activation uh, groups are actually uh, measuring success, and, and how, what will that report look like? Yeah, I think um, that very much <laughs> remains in terms of what is a good concrete way to report on this, and I think one of the, one of the items that we have is we have an idea for how many, in some, in some neighborhoods, not all, in some neighborhoods we have an idea right now for which store for, or block fronts are, are um, boarded up, you know, at the, at, during the summer, and is that number different when we come into the spring, right? 
That's an example. The other is the graffiti audit example, where we can see what has been abated. And so those are the types of efforts that I think we owe to the members who are giving their time of this, as well as to the council. And foot traffic and these signings. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. I look forward to those metrics. Thanks. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan made me think of another question. <laughs> um, I'm curious if, um, if you're really prioritizing, uh, let me back up. Um, are, there, uh, are there property owners that are just waiting for the city to make everything pretty so they could make a gazillion dollars off of their very uh, decrepit property? And if so, how do we make sure people aren't gaming the system to take advantage of our goodwill here on council? I, I don't know if uh, the answer to the first part of that question, if there are anybody waiting for us, I think what I would, the way I would respond to that is that for those properties who are decrepit, who aren't keeping up on their end of the bargain and frankly their commitment to an area, uh, for some of them, and we try to engage as a city, and for some of them we've had success in saying, all right, this is a major issue and its effect is not just the block you own, its effect permeates out. And I think that's a really important approach. It's actually part of how we identify the economic corridors in, across the city as that beacon has a wave effect into the neighborhoods that surround it. And I think that's where the peer pressure of other folks that are along that corridor, the other folks who own the building, if there is stuff we can do to collectively help a property, I think that's worth our collective efforts, and at least that, that's kind of the alignment idea that we're putting toward it. I just don't want to see them financially benefit from limited city resources when they have their own resources where they could fix their property up and actually make it available either for housing people could afford to live in yep. or from, for a, a business property that people could actually afford to lease. The thing you did not talk about is how we're pricing small businesses out of the city of Portland. And nothing in your plan actually addressed the fact that small businesses, just like individuals, are being priced out of the city of Portland from being able to thrive as small business owners. So what's the plan around actually uh, making sure that small businesses, and when, I, and when I say small businesses, I want to be clear. When I say small businesses, I mean small businesses that have 20 or less employees. What do you, what's the plan to make sure they also are able to survive and thrive in all these business districts? Yeah, I think that is a, it's an important question. And again, with the, with the busy slide that had a lot of ideas on it, it's important that we, that we look at that as that is part of that brainstorm. That is where some of the organic items come from the members who are contributing. That's where I would encourage if, if you do have the staff time, if there is a staff person of the team or you have interested members of the community who wanna participate, that that's a great way for us to engage on that because what, what the expediting groups are not, they're not uh, our offices end all be all of here are the answers. They, we want to cultivate the challenges that folks are facing on the ground. And that includes our smallest single and two person uh, operated businesses as well. And we have some of those who are already a member and their con contributions are grand. So my last question, my last question, honest. <laughs> um, uh, could these meetings happen at a time of day that makes it easier for small businesses to participate? Yeah, uh, and again, my office would love to, but we only have seven people. If we had the number of people you had, we'd be at every one of your meetings, but we don't. So, um, but what I don't know is how to plug in when it matters for my office. So maybe that's an offline conversation about how you make sure that we can stay engaged, because again, I can't come every week, but when it matters, I want to be at those tables. Happy to extend that and happy to have that conversation. Thank you. Very good, any further questions? Do we have public testimony on this item? Uh, we have one person signed up. Uh, Caitlin Day is online. Very good. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi, sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. 
Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, upon seeing this agenda and reviewing the council materials, I gotta be honest, I became really concerned. The PowerPoint on the council website mentions one of the goals of these stakeholder groups is to push for the expansion of the enhanced services districts. And I don't think that's a good idea to march forth with establishing more ESDs and expanding the current districts when the city is still undergoing an audit review process. Um, and not only that, but as you all saw in a letter sent to you by Clean and Safe, they are currently stalling the audit process by intentionally withholding their participation because they didn't like how the audit was initiated. So in full transparency on my part, I was one of the stakeholders who communicated with the auditor's office on this issue. And as a Portland resident, and I'm not a San Francisco dark money lobbyist, which is what Portland Business Alliance is claiming, um, I don't even get paid to do this. I'm just a concerned citizen. Um, what I find especially ironic is how part of this ordinance explicitly states that these stakeholders are not lobbying. Well, some of us are currently being hounded for not being registered lobbyists because we suggested an audit idea and did some public records requests. So by this logic, when I talk to the city about concerns around ESDs, it's lobbying. But when the business districts go through these back doors to create their own committees to advance these specific agendas, it's not considered lobbying. So going forth, if these committees are established, I would like to know like how members of the public can both engage and track the process of these committees, especially since it sounds like it's not confirmed if they would be public meetings. Um, so yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, for your questions earlier because I shared a lot of them and I would like more specifics on who exactly is part of these meetings. And Mayor Wheeler, I heard you say earlier it's coming from community, but I also wanna know more about like what community, um, did we talk to unhoused people? Did we talk to nonprofits who are in these business districts? And I also really want to know when the audit review process is slated to continue and what you're going to do about clean and safe refusing to participate. Cause I think that's very relevant to these committees. And to emphasize, these are all questions I have. They're not comments. So I really hope that someone has an answer that can be shared during this meeting because there's major transparency concerns and this proposal doesn't seem to be addressing any of those concerns, at least not for me. Um, so I really hope the city can take these concerns seriously and engage with community members with very real concerns um, who are not really in it for the money. Caitlin, thank you. Uh, the, the irony here is we are being transparent by bringing this forward to the council and having a public discussion about it. But I want to be clear what this is not. Um, this is not an ordinance. This is not an item that has any fiscal impact. Uh, what it is, is it's an advisory group. And I've attempted to cast a wide net to focus on the interests of our neighborhood business districts and their economic recovery and the goal here is for them to advise me. But, and ordinarily, by the way, this happens behind closed doors with no transparency whatsoever. You know, commissioners can ask anybody they want for advice on any subject they want. But, for example, if we wanted to create a new ESD, that has to come back to council with full notice, full disclosure, a presentation, discussion, public testimony, and uh, a vote in front of the entire public on the creation of an ESD. So that, that discussion that you raise, and you raise some very legitimate points, by the way, in my opinion, uh, that would still have to be vetted in public. So I just want to be really clear on what this is not. This is a resolution. And so it is resolving that we will have these conversations, that they will advise me and other commissioners as they're interested, but any actual policy change would have to come back before the city council, any requests for funding. Mm -hmm. That concludes yeah. public testimony. Very good. Uh, this is a resolution. Please call the roll. Maps. I want to thank the mayor for taking these proactive steps to support Portland's continued economic recovery. I look forward to hearing the ideas generated by these groups. And I also want to ask these groups to provide council with advice on at least two projects, which I believe are um, vital to the revitalization of Portland's business districts. First, I believe it's time for the city of Portland to move forward with the construction of Portland's Green Loop. 
I hope these groups can provide this council with advice on how to get that project right. Second, in downtown Portland, O'Brien Square has been closed for four years. It is well past time to reactivate that space. I hope the downtown recovery group can provide this council <coughs> with advice on how to get that project right too. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Um, thank you, Mayor, for bringing this forward. It was uh, a really uh, great conversation to hear all the dimensions. Um, I know you're still shaping uh, the group, so I'm glad that you asked us for input on names, and we'll still continue to work with you. I want to absolutely make sure that we have you know diverse representation um, uh, from the minority chambers and other uh, small business owners and community groups. Um, so that's something I would love to still connect um, moving forward about. Um, and uh, yeah, so just I look forward to uh, continued updates about these areas. I vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, Eric, for that report. Our city really does uh, need this all in effort. Uh, I noticed it includes neighborhoods, businesses, and I think nonprofits and government all at the table. Seems pretty organic. I look forward to updates. I vote aye. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Thank you, Eric Zimmerman, for your presentation and being under the, the, the spotlight for the last half hour or so. Um, I appreciated your answers. Of course, I'm always concerned about people providing advice that leads to money being expended. So I will be uh, keeping a close eye on what's being recommended and how it fits into our budget deliberations because Believe it or not, we start that conversation in a couple of weeks uh, as we start preparing for next year's budget. Um, you know, I'm just always concerned that uh, we don't shut off avenues for public input. And so I will continue to see whether or not we can add value to the entire city's business climate um, uh, so that all of us get to come back from this economic devastation that's been experienced. I'm happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Well, first of all, thanks, Eric. Uh, good job. Uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Thanks to, to my colleagues for a very good conversation. I vote aye. The resolution is adopted. Uh, second reading, item number 896, please. Amend annual grant fund limit not to exceed $450,000 for the Habitat Fund in support of the Bull Run Water Supply Habitat Conservation Plan. Colleagues, this is the second reading. We've heard a presentation. There's been opportunity for public testimony. Any further business on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 897, also a second reading of an ordinance. Amend Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Code to better align with and equi equitably meet city climate action goals. Any further business on this item? Commissioner Rubio. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Last week we had a great conversation about these critical changes to the PSAP program, and I again want to thank everyone who participated during that hearing. Uh, today we have the opportunity to approve these changes and move the program forward with more accountability and a stronger tie to our climate action goals and more potential to be strategic around our investments and grants. Um, so we're here to um, reaffirm and honor the intent of the ballot initiative and also reaffirm its prioritization of low-income communities and communities of color, um, but also to leverage all the lessons learned over the past two and a half years to strengthen PSEF in, the service to our, in service to our communities. With that, um, I want to just uh, acknowledge uh, some of the concerns that we heard um, in, the, in the hearing um, and from community about definitions within the proposed code. We hear you loud and clear. As part of the work ahead, I'm directing PSAF to staff to include defining the terms trainee and apprenticeship as part of their first administrative rulemaking process. In these efforts, I am directing staff to include the PSAF committee, labor, our regional workforce development body, work systems, and other community-based workforce and contractor development partners 
and the PSEF High Roads Advisory Council as key stakeholders in defining these important and impactful terms so that we are both ensuring PSEF continues to create high wage earning opportunities without excluding any sectors um, that are critical to addressing our climate crisis. Secondly, we've heard community desires for the code to define the allocation for the community responsive grant program. We understand this desire had originally planned to include such allocations. The place for those allocations is in the climate investment plan. Community responsive grants will absolutely be maintained as a core component of each climate investment plan. However, it is important that the climate investment plan be an iterative document based on current climate science, city decarbonization priorities, community input and need, and capacity. So I'm excited about these potential changes to ha um, that have, have, have to provide meaningful work in our communities to address our climate crisis and bring up those who have been historically underserved. Um, we're, I'm ready for PSEF committee to get to work on the very first climate impact plan and start making more significant impactful investments on our future. Sam Barrasso and Donnie Oliveira are also here to answer any lingering questions. Otherwise, um, we're ready to move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Maps, you have your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I just want to um, thank Commissioner Rubio for stepping up to the plate and agreeing to uh, continue to dialogue with um, interested parties around the definition of um, trainees and apprenticeships. Um, I think this is a arcane but important subject. Um, I trust you and your team to get this right, but I also ask that as those discussions evolve, if you can keep my office up in the loop, that would be much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Hi. Rubio. I'd like to thank Donnie, Sam, and all of the PSUF staff who have put so much time into all of these changes. The city is super lucky to have such a diligent team. And to the PSUF committee, you have worked so hard and produced such thoughtful and impactful work. And I can't wait to see the recommendation that you bring to us in the form of the climate investment plan. With all that said, I enthusiastically vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for introducing this item and for your incredible leadership guiding this work. When we last met on PCEF and Council Chambers, I asked if we could think outside the box, use investments for targeted goals, and move faster on delivering outcomes for our community. Commissioner Rubio's amendments will do exactly that while we streamline and strengthen this innovative program. All Portlanders need these investments, and it's important to remember that they will save lives. Last year, during the extreme weather event, an improperly maintained tree killed a person sleeping outside. Conversely, a strong and well-maintained tree canopy can keep unhoused Portlanders alive during the summer. We learned last summer that some of our most vulnerable Portlanders during a heat wave were not those living outside. The most common victim was a single person living alone without proper ventilation or with a failed uh, uh, cooling equipment. We must work to prevent these tragedies and PCEF will do exactly that. Donnie and Sam, your adaptive leadership is seen and it's appreciated. I vote aye. Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Donnie and Sam uh, Barrasso. Uh, let me just say, as a, di as a brand new director of the uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, Donnie has hit the ground running. He has been very responsive to uh, the request for information. Um, and I am very, very grateful to have you in that role. Uh, uh, Sam Barrasso, as the P P Portland Community <laughs> Energy Fund uh, manager from its inception, you have never failed us. You've never failed us to be really clear about the values of this program and how you make sure that the trust of voters uh, is paramount in your mind. Last but not least, Commissioner Rubio, your leadership of this program since you showed up has been stellar, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and the program team and the community oversight board uh, to make sure that voters' intent are absolutely realized through this program. I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of nervousness, um, but it's, I uh, feel much more comfortable now because I've had my questions answered to my satisfaction, 
and I know the core values of the folks leading this program, and they share the values that I have, and making sure that this program serves the community that it was designed to serve. So I'm very happy to vote aye, and as always, I'll be uh, walking in hand step with you as we continue to make this program a world model for how a community can lead around climate mitigation. Thank you. Wheeler. Well, I also want to extend my thanks to Donnie and to Sam. And I actually do have a comment about Commissioner Rubio's leadership on this. I, I wish the public at large could appreciate the finesse with which Commissioner Rubio managed this process. This is a very difficult balancing act that she has pulled off here between factions who not only don't always see eye to eye, they are formerly political adversaries. <laughs> and Commissioner Hardesty and I had our turn with, with those groups. We, we were able to, to forge something, but this is much broader. This, this is a, a broader fundamental shift in the way that we want to evolve and move this fund forward. And I, I really have enjoyed watching, watching Commissioner Rubio's performance on this. this. This could have gone sideways, multiple different directions, but she and her team who, who are here, uh, Jillian and others, uh, really did a phenomenal job. And I, I was actually glad to see the Oregonian, I believe it was, in one of their editorial comments described as, as a politically deft maneuver. And I, I thought that's exactly what this is. It's, it's the kind of compromise that moves everybody forward. It's the kind of compromise where, where maybe everybody will have some objections around the edges, but it was a big step in the right direction. And uh, by extension, uh, as I serve with you, I'm really proud of your leadership on this. It was very, very well done. Thank you and congratulations. I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted. Now, I wish we were done, but we're not. We go back to the consent agenda, where I believe. Oh, we have the four fifths. Oh, how could I forget the four fifths item? Please read the four fifths, 898 1. Mr. Mayor, can I ask you? Commissioner, Commissioner Maps. Did we do 898? Uh, no, we didn't. I forgot that too. Wow, I really am rushing today. It must be lunchtime. Yeah, it must be. I'm just not looking forward to what comes at 2 o'clock. Yeah, it's going to be a long chair. sit Let's in this chair. That's the important it. thing. I wore, I wore my lucky tie. Keelan, why don't we go back to 898, please? And this is an emergency ordinance. Amend intergovernmental agreement with Home Forward to authorize budget allocation of $1,552,691 in emergency rent assistance program funds from Department of the Treasury and Community Development Block Grant, CV funds from Department of Housing and Urban Development. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. The emergency rental assistance ERA grant from the U.S. Department of Treasury that was accepted in 2021 for approximately 19.7 million was followed up by a second infusion of funds, ERA-2, amounting to about 25 million. As of last week, the second tranche of the ERA-2 funds are 99% allocated and have supported 5,800 households. We know many households in Portland continue to face imminent risk of eviction. Access to rent assistance resources remains dire. Due to our city's effective and timely expenditure and management of the earlier ERA funds, the city was allocated an additional 1.1 million in reallocation funds last month. The Portland Housing Bureau intends to amend the Home Forward IGA to allocate the funds through the existing Home Forward ERAP IGA for the COVID Emergency Rent Assistance Program and community-based partners. The Housing Bureau will direct an additional 235,000 $386 in community development block grants awarded through the CARES Act in 2020 to provide rent assistance, administrative, and program delivery cost. I'd like to hand this over to Jennifer Chang to bring this home. Jennifer, there you are. If you want to cut slides and get to the heart of the matter, everyone will appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan, and uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Jennifer Chang, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Senior Policy Coordinator at the Portland Housing Bureau. 
And just in following up and summarizing Commissioner Ryan's statements, we wanted to give you a very brief overview of progress of our COVID rent assistance program to date. It started back in summer of 2020. And since that time, there have been, as of last month, over 22,000 households assisted by funding, and this comprises both funding from the city and county. The majority of these funds have been uh, federal, which are CARES and ERAP funding, and also have included city and county general funds as well. And so total of $98 million expended and assisting again over nearly 22,000 households. And in terms of demographics our over the last fiscal year, just looking at a snapshot of the last uh, fiscal year, uh, there have been 65% of the households have been very low income, zero to 30% to AMI, and 78% uh, have identified as being from BIPOC communities. And there's breakouts, uh, I have uh, breakouts of that by uh, different racial and, and ethnic groups if um, there are um, to, to follow up with information on that um, for the council. And then in terms of the partners that have been administering these funds, there have been over 43 different organizations and programs across the city and Multnomah County, including our uh, city funded, uh, a city convened expanded partner network, which is a newer network that started two years ago, is comprised of 18 organizations of which 16 are culturally specific. And they have been working at the, along with these other networks and programs to get the funding out into the community. And that brings us to the purpose of this agenda item, which is to amend our existing, the city's existing Home Forward IGA that is for the ERAP program to add an additional 1.5 million. And this includes the recent reallocation that we received from Treasury, as well as just smaller amounts of the federal funds. So we want to make sure these funds get into the community to assist uh, folks in the next several months. And we're anticipating the funds wow. will be expended by the year end to assist 300 and 50 to 400 additional households. So at this time, I would be glad to answer any questions or have discussion. Colleagues, any questions on this item? Do we have any public testimony? Sorry, let me check. Yep. We have one person. Sign All right, up. three minutes, please. Name for the record. <coughs> It doesn't look like they've joined. Very good. Please call the roll. Max. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the 18 uh, nonprofit organizations on the ground, and 1.5 million is needed. I vote aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Thank you, Jennifer. Great presentation. Thanks, Commissioner thank Ryan. You. Always happy to accept money from the federal government for a good cause. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, the four fifths agenda, please. Authorized. Ninety-eight one. Authorize the city attorney to take legal action against McKinsey and Company, Inc., and any other third party that assisted opioid manufacturers in deceptively marketing prescription opioids to recover public funds that have been and will be expended by the city as a result of the manufacture, marketing, and distribution of prescription opioids. Colleagues, thank you for agreeing to this four-fifths item. In 2018, council authorized the city attorney to file a lawsuit against opioid manufacturers and distributors to hold them accountable for the role they played in causing the opioid epidemic and to recover funds to help in our efforts to abate the ongoing opioid, opioid crisis which has resulted. The city has just begun to receive some money in connection with the original led litigation. This resolution would expand the authority granted to the city attorney to file a similar lawsuit against McKinsey and Company who work closely with Purdue and other opioid manufacturers in developing the business model and marketing that led to the original opioid crisis. In filing suit against McKinsey, the city of Portland will join hundreds of other jurisdictions across the country in an attempt to recover additional funds for ongoing efforts to address the opioid crisis. Senior Deputy Attorney Naomi Sheffield is here to present the resolution in brief. 
I actually don't think I have anything else to add beyond what the mayor said, unless you have questions for me. It is an extension of the original resolution to allow us to file suit against me. Thanks, no, I mean, any questions? Commissioner Hardesty, no. Uh, is there any public testimony on this item? No, no one signed up. This is a resolution. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Resolution is adopted back to the consent agenda. Let's read the one that Commissioner Hardesty is pulling back to her office, 892. Amend public right-of-way parking code to reflect changes in on-street parking laws, rules, and technology related to meter feeding. Commissioner Hardesty. I think you may. I'll be pulling that item back into my office. Without objection. 890, please. This is an emergency ordinance. Authorize intergovernmental agreement with Portland State University to design and execute a summit in early 2023 on equitable civic engagement and co-governance for amount not to exceed 108,850. Who pulled this item? Uh, if a member of the public, I believe. Let's hear their testimony first, please. Marianne Fitzgerald. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners uh, Hardesty, Maps, Rubio, and Ryan. I've been sitting here for three and a half hours, just like you, waiting for my turn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We um, appreciate it. I uh, urge you to vote no on both uh, items 890 and 891. Um, I was particularly concerned that there was no actual text of the intergovernmental agreement attached to either of these uh, agenda items. And uh, I really didn't understand what the scope of work is for this project, who's going to do what. There were numerous consultants mentioned in the um, language, and uh, I really don't understand what the expected outcome of this work will be. Um, it's not an emergency. In fact, um, I recommend that you wait until after the election, because if the voters vote for uh, amendments to our city charter, that might change the um, conversation that we have on this item. So I don't understand why this is an emergency item. I don't understand what the scope is, who's doing what or what the outcome is. And um, I included an email of some questions that I asked Mr. Montoya back in February. You know, I scratched my head when he sent me that, that, that reply to my questions and I don't really have any better understanding than I do today. Um, I, in the interest of time for item 891, it's just a similar concern. They're two tied together. Um, I really believe that um, civic life needs to bring the community back into the Office of Community and Civic Life and have some conversation about the community about what we expect, uh, because it looks to me like a repeat of what happened a few years ago when Commissioner Udaly proposed to repeal Code 3.96 without notifying the neighborhood associations that were most affected by this proposal. Um, I just think that it needs more time. These IGAs are not ready for prime time and I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And, and in the interest of time, can you read 891 too, please? Authorize intergovernmental agreement with Portland State University to expand and improve the neighborhood profiles project for amount not to exceed $61,250. And is Marianne the only person signed up to testify on either of those? So what may, maybe we, because uh, I, 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 I figured and I, I might have a comment as well. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald, for being here today. Uh, I do have Director Montoya here to answer any specific yes. questions, but very briefly, colleagues, as you may recall, Civic Life was authorized uh, the funding as part of the spring bump to create forward-thinking solutions to the often ineffectual civic engagement framework for our city bureaus and residents. One of the challenges to engaging all Portlanders is that there are many different ideas about what civic and community engagement means. Also, many other cities have engaged frameworks that we have not considered as part of our own engagement toolbox. <clears throat> 
interim director, Montoya, has worked with PSU's Hatfield School of Government Center for Public Service and Oregon's Kitchen Table to address both of these issues. This ordinance will fund a convening of national engagement practitioners and local engagement innovators and practitioners to publicly stress test the ideas emerging from around the country regarding community engagement and inclusive government. So, Mayor, that is my response to number 890. Number 891, <clears throat> um, uh, in 2122, Civic Life worked with the Population Research Center to create profiles of our 95 neighborhoods and seven districts. The first draft of these profiles recently completed their public comments period. This ordinance allows Portland State University and our city, GIS, and open data groups to update these profiles and design a public searchable database so everyone and anyone can easily use this data rich profiles. It is so important that all of our residents, bureaus, and community-based partners have the most current and meaningful information about who lives in each neighborhood. Interim Director Montoya has shared the initial drafts of these profiles, and we're really looking forward to giving you a full demonstration of these profiles once he and Portland State University incorporates the public comments and suggestions that are part of this ordinance. Uh, Interim Director Montoya is here to answer any additional questions folks might have. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just give my two cents on this while while the director is coming forward. Um, and, and I wanted to reiterate just the, the technical aspect of this, that there already was a discussion about this during the budget process, and this is the allocation of those funds. And, and so I feel obligated to honor uh, that prior decision by the city council. Uh, but I also think, that as I look at this, it, 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 I agree with Marianne that sort of the, the existential question is what is the form of government, but I still believe the information is valid. I still think the question of how do we increase or support public input to a greater degree is an important question regardless of what form of government we settle on for the simple reason that right now the public doesn't trust us full stop. And one of the reasons people don't trust us, and I don't mean us specifically, uh, although somebody would probably make that case, um, they don't feel included in the conversations we're having about how decisions are made. And that is a legitimate issue. And the reason I support this is I believe it begins to address that question. The second part of this also raised an eyebrow with me. I'm not surprised that, that Marianne raised concerns about the IGA. The devil's always in the details in an IGA. And so upon evaluating the IGA, I'm confident that it does not substantially shift any policy that the city of Portland is engaged in, nor does it preclude any policy that the city of Portland is engaged in. It is creating, as, as was indicated, profiles of specific areas so we know a little bit more about those areas. But, but it's, it's, um, it's general in nature. Um, and I, I think that can only be helpful in better understanding the demographics of our city. So that, that's sort of my two cents on this. I don't know if other people have other questions or thoughts. I, I see Commissioner Maps has a question and I'm certainly open to that conversation. Sure, I just have a quick question. Um, Director, why is this an emergency? Thank you for the question and thank you, Marianne, for the testimony. Um, it's simply an emergency because that's a, a, a quick way to begin this work. Um, it, it was an expediency. I actually didn't pay it much attention. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that response. So uh, I, I have long been a proponent of changing the statutory language that creates emergency ordinances because people say, well, what's the emergency? The emergency ordinance, all it means is that it's implemented immediately upon passage by the council, whereas non-emergency ordinances, the only difference is that they don't happen until 30 days after the council votes, and it's very confusing to the public, and I'm a strong proponent. If we can change the language from emergency, which people respond to in one way that's not what we're talking about, 
um, to just say immediate ordinances or immediately implemented ordinances or something like that. Um, I, 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 and, and legal counsel's nodding that maybe this is something we could take up because it comes up at every meeting. And, and I'm, yeah, at any rate. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, do you have more on either of these? Public testimony? We're done. We already did it. 890, call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ryan, I apologize. No, sorry. I know it's, we'd like a break. Um, good to see you. I, I am, I just don't understand the rush. I thought Marianne's testimony was solid. I don't understand why we have to build some trust with our neighborhood associations. And it seems like this is an opportunity on this item to engage more of the neighborhood associations so they don't feel as though they were left out of this journey. That's Let me confusion. say with 96 neighborhood associations, having only one person come to talk about not understanding it, I see as a, a, as a positive. We have been very engaged with neighborhood associations. Uh, sometimes people just don't like the answers that they get. So I would just leave it there, I, uh, unless you wanted to. Thank you for the concern. I share the concern. Um, what I didn't realize was that I needed an engagement plan for the engagement plan for the engagement plan. Um, I understand and completely appreciate the lack of trust and the legitimacy and trust must be earned. Um, what I haven't had an opportunity to do with, uh, with your offices or with any of the uh, external partners that we have, especially our neighborhood associations, is present the fullness of the plan as it unfolds. These two ordinances, all they're doing is getting that work started. Um, I, I can't start the engagement plan or the engagement plan for the engagement plan until I have some contractors on board. And both the Oregon's Kitchen Table and the Center for Public Service and the Population Research Center are those contractors that can help get this started. That's really what that was about. But I understand too Marianne's concerns and it is absolutely crucial that we begin to do the external engagement so people can be involved and that's what this, uh, this, this ordinance will help do. I thought that was very well stated, uh, Director Montoya. Uh, yeah, we don't need to have a plan to develop the plan to actually do the engagement. It, it, it does suggest more transparency and communication with the public, and we'll, we'll leave that with you. Yes. Good. 890, call the roll. Maps. Colleagues, I'm going to vote no on both of these ordinances today. Um, and I'm not voting no because I have... Um, any inherent opposition to 890 or 891. Rather, I'm voting no in the uh, in the hopes that we could perhaps bump this from an emergency ordinance to a regular ordinance. As I take a look at this discussion, um, and I have heard from neighborhood groups about these two items over the course of the last several days, um, it feels like there's a disconnect between the stakeholders you serve and and uh, your planning processes. Um, and I think it would be healthy for the Office of Civic Life to engage in a little bit of civic dialogue over the next week or so, uh, explain to folks how we got here, what's going on. I think once um, community groups understand what you're doing, um, this is going to be fine. I anticipate, uh, should this come back to council next week, to, to vote yes on this. But in the meantime, I will vote no and urge the Office of Civic Life to uh, continue to educate the community about uh, what's going on with these two ordinances. Thanks. So, no. Mayor. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hart, point of order, we're, Mayor. we're in the role. Uh, uh, point of order, go ahead. Point of order. Uh, I will, uh, I move to remove the emergency clause uh, due to uh, my colleague. And Can I suspend the role for that purpose? Um, your Mayor, I think, it, Your Honor, I think it would be clearer if we went through the role. Let's, let's go and I'll vote no for reconsideration. So let's just go through the role as, as per Rubio. usual. Rubio. Yes. Ryan. No. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. No for the purposes of reconsideration. Um, colleagues, I'd like to move reconsideration on item 890. Can I get a second? A second. I have a second from Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, colleagues, I, I heard what Commissioner Maps said with a desire to have a further discussion with the neighborhood associations. Um, that seems like a very pragmatic uh, response. Um, and for that purpose, I'd like to, you to support reconsideration for that purpose. Please call the, uh, I, and I got a second, please call the roll on reconsideration. 
Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Uh, the item 890 is reconsidered. Colleagues, I'd like to move that we remove, we amend uh, emergency ordinance 890 to remove the emergency clause. Can I get a second? A second. Please call a roll on the amendment. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. 890 is the first reading of the non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Eight, eight, item 891, call the roll. Now could we remove the emergency before we call oh, the roll? I guess we can. So we, we don't have to hear yeah, that good again. Call, good call. Uh, make a motion. Uh, may I move that we remove the emergency clause on 891? Second. We have a motion and a second to remove the emergency clause from 891. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll on the amendment. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. Uh, item number 891 is a non-emergency <laughs> ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, and I'm sort of working backwards here, and I apologize, folks. Uh, 86, 886. Pay settlement of Evelyn Cushing body, bodily injury claim in the sum of $47,500 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a claim brought against the city in March of 2021. Senior claims analyst David Farrow here uh, is here to present the ordinance, but before we do that, who pulled it and could we get their testimony? Mark Porras. Mark, are you still here? Is he still on? Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi, Mark. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, uh, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we pulled this item from consent because this is another protest-related settlement about which there was very little public information. Uh, the $47,500 amount is suspiciously close to the 50 k trigger for making it to the regular agenda. Uh, we again ask that you put all police misconduct settlements on the regular agenda to save the community the trouble of pulling these items and to ensure that the city attorney or risk management appears in front of the public to shed some light on just how much is getting dispersed and how frequently to people harmed by PPB. Uh, we have no objection to the city paying this settlement. Uh, we hope the medic who was at the protest on September 23rd, 2020 to take care of people harmed by police is able to fully recover from their own injuries at the hands of PPB. Having seen the video, we take offense at the term encounter as used in the ordinance. This was an outright unprovoked assault and another example of a paid out $700,000 round in protest related settlements and jury awards in the past two years. Uh, we understand that this case went to independent police review where the two allegations um, against officer Brian Wheeler were both sustained. He used inappropriate force and his tactics and decision-making were not in accordance with training guidelines. We know PPB, we don't know what sort of corrective action was taken in order for PPB to feel comfortable continuing to employ an officer who would brutalize a medic in this manner. Uh, we'd like to understand the reasoning behind keeping a dangerous cop employed. And we show up here despite understanding that these settlements are a done deal in an attempt to get you to engage and discuss the underlying policy issues around police misconduct. We haven't heard any meaningful discussions about stopping police violence at protests, nor police shootings during or after these council votes. And we disagree with the Senate public has other ways of learning about the true cost of policing in Portland. We do not. Information is going to come out here and is coming out out here today that the public has not yet seen and would not see had this item remained on the consent agenda. Finally, to repeat our continuing ask for transparency, we urge the city to report the true cost of settling these cases. Impact statements should include the amount of time that the city attorney's office and risk management spend on settlements. Uh, if there's anyone on council that would like to champion our calls for discussing policies and transparency around costs, it would benefit the community, the survivors, and the police themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Is there any, uh, yes, go ahead. We do have another person signed up for testimony on this. Sure. Beatrix Lee. Welcome. Beatrix, you're muted. Beatrix, will you try to unmute? I 
doesn't look like they're able to unmute. Very good. Colleagues, any further discussion on this item? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted, and I believe we have one more, 883. Authorize a letter of agreement between the city and the Portland Police Command Officers Association to adopt a corrective action guide to ensure consistency and fairness. This is an emergency ordinance that seeks to approve the letter of agreement with the Portland Police Command Officers Association. We have Ron Zito here from Labor Relations to answer any questions anybody may have. Uh, I assume we have public testimony on this. Yeah, Mark Porras pulled this item. Mark, go ahead. Three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, actually, I'm kind of bummed that uh, Beatrix didn't get a chance to testify there. And also, um, even, I'm even angrier that uh, Mr. Farrow did not present that video to you. I was under the impression that he would. Um, so I hope that you all do get a chance to see that video from item 886. Uh, let me get back to 883, though. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have some concerns around this item, but I'm going to be brief. You all have a long afternoon ahead of you. It's our understanding that once local collective bargaining contracts expire, the statewide standards become the default. You should be aware that the Commission on Statewide Law Enforcement Standards of Conduct and Discipline. Uh, <laughs> policy in deadly force incidents to receive discipline as low as written reprimand. We hope the city is working to strengthen these state standards to minimally match what is already in the PPA and PPCOA guidelines. Also, we've been asking the city to make the entire PPA collective bargaining agreement document text searchable so that the community does not need to scan all 105 pages to find what we're looking for. Currently, among other sections, <laughs> and that is the portion that you are getting ready to copy and paste into a completely different collective bargaining agreement Please fix the searchability issue before copying and pasting. And if you're able to get Mr. Farrow to show that video to you, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Is there any public other, for that, thank you, Mark. Is there further public testimony? No, that's it. Very good. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. As we know, the corrective action guide that this is referring to negotiated between the city and the Portland Police Association was developed to, amongst other things, ensure consistency in the implementation of corrective action in the Bureau. This LOA ensures that consistency extends across officers and command staff alike. I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted. And I hope you all enjoy your lengthy lunch. We are adjourned, and we'll see you at 2 p.m. Bring snacks.